An Arrest by Ambrose Bierce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Arrest by Ambrose Bierce. Having murdered his brother-in-law, Oren Brower of Kentucky was a fugitive from justice. From the county jail where he had been confined to await his trial, he had escaped by knocking down his jailer with an iron bar, robbing him of his keys, and, opening the outer door, walking out into the night. The jailer being unarmed, Brower got no weapon with which to defend his recovered liberty. As soon as he was out of the town he had the folly to enter a forest. This was many years ago, when that region was wilder than it is now. The night was pretty dark, with neither moon nor stars visible, and as Brower had never dwelt thereabout, and knew nothing of the lay of the land, he was, naturally, not long in losing himself. He could not have said if he were getting farther away from the town or going back to it, a most important matter to Oren Brower. He knew that in either case a posse of citizens with a pack of bloodhounds would soon be on his track, and his chance of escape was very slender, but he did not wish to assist in his own pursuit. Even an added hour of freedom was worth having. Suddenly he emerged from the forest into an old road, and there before him saw, indistinctly, the figure of a man, motionless in the gloom. It was too late to retreat. The fugitive felt that at the first movement back toward the wood he would be, as he afterward explained, filled with buckshot. So the two stood there like trees, Brower nearly suffocated by the activity of his own heart, the other the emotions of the other are not recorded. A moment later, it may have been an hour, the moon sailed into a patch of unclouded sky, and the hunted man saw that visible embodiment of law lift an arm and point significantly toward and beyond him. He understood. Turning his back to his captor, he walked submissively away in the direction indicated, looking to neither the right nor the left, hardly daring to breathe, his head and back actually aching with a prophecy of buckshot. Brower was as courageous a criminal as ever lived to be hanged. That was shown by the conditions of awful personal peril in which he had coolly killed his brother-in-law. It is needless to relate them here. They came out at his trial, and the revelation of his calmness in confronting them came near to saving his neck. But what would you have? When a brave man is beaten, he submits. So they pursued their journey jailward along the old road through the woods. Only once did Brower venture a turn of the head just once when he was in deep shadow and he knew that the other was in moonlight he looked backward his captor was burton duff the jailer as white as death and bearing upon his brow the livid mark of the iron bar oren brower had no further curiosity eventually they entered the town which was alight but deserted only the women and children remained and they were off the streets straight toward the jail the criminal held his way straight up to the main entrance he walked laid his hands upon the knob of the heavy iron door, pushed it open without command, entered, and found himself in the presence of a half-dozen armed men. Then he turned. Nobody else entered. On a table in the corridor lay the dead body of Burton Duff. End of An Arrest Recording by Sean Michael Hogan, St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada The Bowman by Arthur Mackin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Bowman by Arthur Mackin. It was during the retreat of the 80,000, and the authority of the censorship is sufficient excuse for not being more explicit. But it was on the most awful day of that awful time, on the day when ruin and disaster came so near that their shadow fell over London far away, and, without any certain news, the hearts of men failed within them and grew faint, as if the agony of the army in the battlefield had entered into their souls. On this dreadful day, then, when three hundred thousand men in arms with all their artillery swelled like a flood against the little English company, there was one point above all other points in our battle line which was for a time in awful danger not merely of defeat but of utter annihilation with the permission of the censorship and of the military expert this corner may perhaps be described as a salient 
and if this angle were crushed and broken, then the English force as a whole would be shattered, the Allied left would be turned, and Sedan would inevitably follow. All the morning the German guns had thundered and shrieked against this corner, and against the thousand or so of men who held it. The men joked at the shells, and found funny names for them, and had bets about them, and greeted them with scraps of music hall songs. But the shells came on and burst, and tore good Englishmen limb from limb, and tore brother from brother, and, as the heat of the day increased, so did the fury of that terrific cannonade. There was no help, it seemed. The English artillery was good, but there was not nearly enough of it, and it was being steadily battered into scrap iron. There comes a moment in a storm at sea when people say to one another, It is at its worst, it can blow no harder. And then there is a blast ten times more fierce than any before it. So it was in these British trenches. There were no stouter hearts in the world than the hearts of these men, but even they were appalled as this seven times heated hell of the German cannonade fell upon them and overwhelmed them and destroyed them. And at this very moment they saw from their trenches that a tremendous host was moving against their lines. Five hundred of the thousand remained, and as far as they could see the German infantry was pressing on against them, column after column, a grey world of men, ten thousand of them, as it appeared afterwards. There was no hope at all. They shook hands, some of them. One man improvised a new version of the battle song. Goodbye, goodbye to Tipperary, ending with, and we shan't get there. And they all went on firing steadily, the officers pointing out that such an opportunity for high-class fancy shooting might never occur again. The Germans dropped line after line. The Tipperary humorist asked, What price Sydney Street? And the few machine guns did their best, but everyone knew it was of no use. The dead grey bodies lay in companies and battalions, as others came on and on and on, and they swarmed and stirred and advanced from beyond and beyond. World without end, amen, said one of the British soldiers with some irreverence as he took aim and fired. And then he remembered. He says he cannot think why or wherefore. A queer vegetarian restaurant in London, where he had once or twice eaten, eccentric dishes of cutlets made of lentils and nuts that pretended to be steak. On all the plates in this restaurant there was printed a figure of St. George in blue with the motto, Adsit Anglus Sanctus Georgius. May St. George be a present help to the English. This soldier happened to know Latin and other useless things, and now, as he fired at his man in the grey advancing mass, three hundred yards away, he entered the pious vegetarian motto. He went on firing to the end, and at last Bill, on his right, had to clout him cheerfully over the head to make him stop, pointing out as he did so that the king's ammunition cost money and was not lightly to be wasted in drilling funny patterns into dead Germans. For as the Latin scholar uttered his invocation, he felt something between a shudder and an electric shock pass through his body. The roar of the battle died down in his ears to a gentle murmur. Instead of it, he says, he heard a great voice and a shout louder than a thunder peal, crying, Hooray! 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 His heart grew hot as a burning coal. It grew cold as ice within him, as it seemed to him that a tumult of voices answered to his summons. He heard, or seemed to hear, thousands shouting, St. George! St. George! Our Messiah! Ah, sweet saint, grant us good deliverance. St. George for merry England! A row, a row! Monsieur St. George! Ah, St. George! Ah, St. George, a long bow and a strong bow. Heaven's night, aid us. And as a soldier heard these voices, he saw before him, beyond the trench, a long line of shapes, with a shining about them. They were like men who drew the bow, and with another shout their cloud of arrows flew singing and tingling through the air toward the German hosts. The other men in the trench were firing all the while. They had no hope, but they aimed just as if they had been shooting at Bisley. Suddenly one of them lifted up his voice in the plainest English. God help us, he bellowed to the man next to him. But we're blooming marvels. Look at those grey gentlemen. Look at them. Do you see them? 
They're not going down in dozens, nor in hundreds. It's thousands, it is. Look, look, there's a regiment gone while I'm talking to ye. Shut it, the other soldier bellowed, taking aim. What are ye gassing about? But he gulped with astonishment even as he spoke, for indeed the gray men were falling by the thousands. The English could hear the guttural screams of the German officers, the crackle of their revolvers as they shot the reluctant, and still line after line crashed to the earth. All the while the Latin-bred soldier heard the cry, Aro, aro, Monseigneur, dear Saint, quick to our aid, Saint George, help us, my chevalier, defend us. The singing arrows fled so swift and thick that they darkened the air, the heathen horde melted before them. More machine guns, Bill yelled to Tom. Don't hear them, Tom yelled back, but thank God anyway, they've got it in the neck. In fact, there were ten thousand dead German soldiers left before that salient of the English army, and consequently there was no sedan. In Germany, a country ruled by scientific principles, the great general staff decided that the contemptible English must have employed shells containing an unknown gas of a poisonous nature, as no wounds were discernible on the bodies of the dead German soldiers. But the man who knew what nuts tasted like when they called themselves steak knew also that St. George had brought his agent court bowmen to help the English. End of The Bowman Recording by David Lawrence July 2009 in Brampton, Ontario The Conclave of Corpses Anonymous this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Piazza. The Conclave of Corpses. Anonymous. Some three hundred years since, when the convent of Kreuzberg was in its glory, one of the monks who dwelt therein, wishing to ascertain something of the hereafter of those whose bodies lay all undecayed in the cemetery, visited it alone in the dead of night for the purpose of prosecuting his inquiries on that fearful subject. As he opened the trap-door of the vault, a light burst from below, but, deeming it to be only the lamp of the sacristan, the monk drew back and awaited his departure, concealed behind the high altar. The sacristan emerged not, however, from the opening, and the monk, tired of waiting, approached and finally descended the rugged steps which led into the dreary depths. No sooner had he set foot on the lowermost stair than the well-known scene underwent a complete transformation in his eyes. He had long been accustomed to visit the vault, and whenever the sacristan went thither, he was almost sure to be with him. He therefore knew every part of it, as well as he did the interior of his own narrow cell, and the arrangement of its contents was perfectly familiar to his eyes. What, then, was his horror to perceive that this arrangement, which even but that morning had come under his observation as usual, was altogether altered, and a new and wonderful one substituted in its stead. A dim, lurid light pervaded the desolate abode of darkness, and it just sufficed to give to his view a sight of the most singular description. On each side of him the dead but imperishable bodies of the long-buried brothers of the convent sat erect in their lidless coffins, their cold, starry eyes glaring at him with lifeless rigidity, their withered fingers locked together on their breasts, their stiffened limbs motionless and still. It was a sight to petrify the stoutest heart, and the monks quailed before it, though he was a philosopher and a skeptic to boot. At the upper end of the vault, at a rude table formed of a decayed coffin, or something which once served the same purpose, sat three monks. They were the oldest courses in the charnel-house, for the inquisitive brother knew their faces well, 
and the cadaverous hue of their cheeks seemed still more cadaverous in the dim light shed upon them, while their hollow eyes gave forth what looked to him like flashes of flame. A large book lay open before one of them, and the others bent over the rotten table as if in intense pain, or in deep and fixed attention. No word was said, no sound was heard, the vault was as silent as the grave, its awful tenants still as statues. Fain would the curious monk have receded from this horrible place, fain would he have retraced his steps and sought again his cell, fain would he have shut his eyes to the fearful scene, but he could not stir from the spot. He felt rooted there, and, though he once succeeded in turning his eyes to the entrance of the vault, to his infinite surprise and dismay, he could not discover where it lay, nor perceive any possible means of exit. He stood thus for some time. At length the aged monk at the table beckoned him to advance, with slow, tottering steps he made his way to the group, and at length stood in front of the table while the other monks raised their heads and glanced at him with a fixed, lifeless look that froze the current of his blood. He knew not what to do. His senses were fast forsaking him. Heaven seemed to have deserted him for his incredulity. In this moment of doubt and fear he bethought him of a prayer and, as he proceeded, he felt himself becoming possessed of a confidence he had before unknown. He looked on the book before him. It was a large volume bound in black and clasped with bands of gold, with fastenings of the same metal. It was inscribed at the top of each page, Liber Obedienti. He could read no further. He then looked first in the eyes of him before whom it lay open, and then in those of his fellows. He finally glanced around the vault of the corpses who filled every visible coffin in its dark and spacious womb. Speech came to him, and resolution to use it. He addressed himself to the awful beings in whose presence he stood, in the words of one having authority with him. Pax Vobis, twas thus he spake, peace be to ye. Hic nulla Pax, replied an ancient monk, in a hollow tremulous tone, bearing his breast the while, here is no peace. He pointed to his bosom as he spoke, and the monk, casting his eye upon it, beheld his heart within, surrounded by living fire, which seemed to feed on it, but not consume it. He turned away in a fright, but ceased not to prosecute his inquiries. Pax vobis in nobili nomine, he spake again. Peace be to ye, in the name of the Lord. Hic non pax, the hollow and heart-rending tone of the ancient monk who sat at the right of the table, were heard to answer. On glancing at the bared bosom of this hapless being, also the same sight was exhibited the heart surrounded by a devouring flame, but still remaining fresh and unconsumed under its operation. Once more the monk turned away and addressed the aged man in the center. Pax vobis in nomine domini, he proceeded. At these words the being to whom they were addressed raised his head, put forward his hand, and closing the book with a loud clap said, Speak on, it is yours to ask, and mine to answer. The monk felt reassured, and his courage rose with the occasion. Who are ye? he inquired. Who may ye be? We know not, was the answer. Alas, we know not. We know not, we know not, echoed in melancholy tones the denizens of the vault. What do ye here? pursued the querist. We await the last day, the day of the last judgment, 
Alas for us, woe, 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 woe resounded on all sides. The monk was appalled, but still he proceeded. What did ye to deserve such doom as this? What may your crime be that deserves such dole and sorrow? As he asked the question, the earth shook under him, and a crowd of skeletons uprose from a range of graves which yawned suddenly at his feet. These are our victims, answered the old monk. They suffered at our hands. We suffer now, while they are at peace, and we shall suffer. For how long? asked the monk. Forever and ever, was the answer. Forever and ever, forever and ever, died along the vault. May God have mercy on us, was all the monk could exclaim. The skeletons vanished, the graves closing over them. The aged men disappeared from his view, the bodies fell back in their coffins, the light fled, and the den of death was once more enveloped in its usual darkness. On the monk's revival he found himself lying at the foot of the altar. The gray dawn of a spring morning was visible, and he was fain to retire to his cell as secretly as he could, for fear he should be discovered. From thenceforth he eschewed vain philosophy, says the legend, and devoting his time to the pursuit of true knowledge and the extension of the power, greatness, and glory of the church, died in the odor of sanctity and was buried in that holy vault where his body is still visible. Requiescat in pace. End of the Conclave of Corpses Dream Town by Henry Sleesar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Dream Town by Henry Sleesar. The woman in the doorway looked so harmless. Who was to tell she had some rather startling interests? The woman in the doorway looked like Mom in the homier political cartoons. She was plump, apple-cheeked, white-haired. She wore a fussy old-fashioned nightgown and was busily clutching a worn house robe around her expansive middle. She blinked at Sol Becker's rain-flattened hair and hangdog expression and said, What is it? What do you want? I I'm sorry, Sol's voice was pained. Th the man in the diner said you might put me up. I, I had my car stolen. A hitchhiker. Going to Salinas. He was puffing. Hitchhiker? I don't understand. She clucked at the sight of the pool of water he was creating in her foyer. Well, come inside, for heaven's sake, you're soaking. Thanks, Sol said gratefully. With the door firmly shut behind him, the warm interior of the little house covered him like a blanket. He shivered and let the warmth seep over him. I'm terribly sorry. I, I know how late it is. He looked at his watch, but the face was too misty to make out the hour. Must be nearly three, the woman sniffed. You couldn't have come at a worse time. I was just on my way to court. The words slid by him. If I could just stay overnight until the morning, I could call some friends in San Fernando. I, I'm very susceptible to head colds, he added inanely. Well, take those shoes off first, the woman grumbled. You can undress in the parlor, if you'll keep off the rug. You won't mind using the sofa? No, uh, of course not. I'd be happy to pay. Oh, tush, nobody's asking you to pay. This isn't a hotel. You mind if I go back upstairs? They're going to miss me at the palace. No, uh, of course not, Saul said. He followed her into the darkened parlor and watched as she turned the screw on a hurricane-style lamp, shedding a yellow pool of light over half a flowery sofa and doily-covered wing chair. You, you go up. I'll be perfectly fine. Guess you can use a towel, though. I'll, I'll get you one. Then I'm going up. 
We wake pretty early in this house. Breakfast's at seven. You'll have to be up if you want any. I, I really can't thank you enough. Tush, the woman said. She scurried out and returned a moment later with a thick bath towel. Sorry I can't give you any bedding, but you'll find it nice and warm in here. She squinted at the dim face of a ship's wheel clock on the mantel and made a noise with her tongue. Three-thirty, she exclaimed. I'll miss the whole execution. The what? Good night, young man, Mom said firmly. She patted off, leaving Sol holding the towel. He patted his face and then scrubbed the wet tangle of brown hair. Carefully he stepped off the carpet and onto the stone floor in front of the fireplace. He removed his drenched coat and suit jacket and squeezed water out over the ashes. He stripped down to his underwear, wondering about next morning's possible embarrassment, and decided to use the damp bath towel as a blanket. The sofa was downy and comfortable. He curled up under the towel, shivered once, and closed his eyes. He was tired and very sleepy, and his customary nightly review was limited to a few detached thoughts about the wedding he was supposed to attend in Salinas that weekend, the hoodlum who had responded to his good nature by dumping him out of his own car, the slogging walk to the village, the little round woman who was hurrying off like the white rabbit to some mysterious appointment on the upper floor. Then he went to sleep. A voice awoke him, shrill and questioning. Are you naked? His eyes flew open, and he pulled the towel protectively around his body and glared at the little girl with the rust-red pigtails. Huh, mister? She said, pushing a finger against her freckled nose. Are you? No, he said angrily. I'm not naked. Will, will you please go away? Sally. It was Mom appearing in the doorway of the parlor. You leave the gentleman alone. She went off again. Yes, Sol said. Please let me get dressed, if you don't mind. The girl didn't move. What time is it? Dunno, Sally shrugged. I like poached eggs. They're my favorite eggs in the whole world. That's good, Sol said desperately. Now, why don't you be a good girl and eat your poached eggs in the kitchen? Ain't ready yet. You going to stay for breakfast? I'm not going to do anything until you get out of here. She put the end of a pigtail in her mouth and sat down on the chair opposite. I went to the palace last night. They had an exolution. Please, Sol groaned. Be a good girl, Sally. If you let me get dressed, I'll show you how to take off your thumb. Oh, that's an old trick. Did you ever see an exolution? No. Did you ever see a little girl with her hide tanned? Huh? Sally! Mom again, sterner. You get out of there or you know what. Okay, the girl said blithely. I'm going to the palace again, if I brush my teeth. Aren't you ever going to get up? She skipped out of the room, and Sol hastily sat up and reached for his trousers. When he had dressed the clothes still damp and unpleasant against his skin, he went out of the parlor and found the kitchen. Mom was busy at the stove. He said, Good morning. Breakfast in ten minutes, she said cheerfully. You like poached eggs? Sure. Do you have a telephone? In the hallway. Party line. So you may have to wait. He tried for fifteen minutes to get through, but there was a woman on the line who was terribly upset about a cotton dress she had ordered from Sears and was telling the world about it. Finally he got his call through to Salinas, and a sleepy-voiced Fred, his old army buddy, listened somewhat indifferently to his tale of woe. I might miss the wedding, Sol said unhappily. I'm, I'm awfully sorry. Fred didn't seem to be half as sorry as he was. When Sol hung up he was feeling more despondent than ever. A man, tall and rangy, with a bobbing Adam's apple and a lined face, came into the hallway. Hello? he said inquiringly. You the fella had the car stolen? Yes. The man scratched his ear. Take you over to Sheriff Coogan after breakfast. He'll let the Stadies know about it. My name's Dawes. Sol accepted a careful handshake. Don't get many people coming to town, Dawes said, looking at him curiously. Ain't seen a stranger in years. You look like the rest of us," he chuckled. Mom called out, Breakfast! At the table Dawes asked his destination. Wedding in Salinas, he explained. Old army friend of mine. I picked this hitchhiker up about two miles from here. He seemed okay. Never can tell, Dawes said placidly, munching egg. Hey, Ma, that's why you were so late coming to court last night? That's right, Pa. She poured the blackest coffee Sol had ever seen. 
Didn't miss much, though. What court is that? Sol asked politely, his mouth full. I'm a gum, Sally said, a piece of toast sticking out from the side of her mouth. Don't you know nothing? Armagon, Dawes corrected. He looked sheepishly at the stranger. Don't expect Mr. He cocked an eyebrow. What's the name? Becker. Don't expect Mr. Becker knows anything about Armagon. It's just a dream, you know. He smiled apologetically. Dream? You mean this Armagon is a place you dream about? Yup, Dawes said. He lifted cup to lip. Great coffee, Ma. He leaned back with a contented sigh. Dream about it every night. Got so used to the place I get all confused in the daytime. Mom said, I get muddle-headed, too, sometimes. You mean, Saul put his napkin in his lap, you, you mean you dream about the same place? Sure, Sally piped. We all go there at night. I'm going to the palace again, too. If you brush your teeth, Mom said primly. If I brush my teeth. Boy, y you should have seen the exolution. Execution, her father said. Oh, my goodness, Mom got up hastily. That reminds me. I gotta call poor Mrs. Brundage. It's the least I could do. Good idea, Dawes said. And I'll have to round up some folks and get old Brundage out of there. Saul was staring. He opened his mouth, but couldn't think of the right question to ask. Then he blurted out, What execution? None of your business, the man said coldly. You eat up, young man, if you want me to get Sheriff Coogan looking for your car. The rest of the meal went silently, except for Sally's insistence upon singing her school song between mouthfuls. When Dawes was through, he pushed back his plate and ordered Sol to get ready. Sol grabbed his topcoat and followed the man out the door. Have to stop someplace first, Dawes said, but we'll be picking up the sheriff on the way. Okay with you? Fine, Sol said uneasily. The rain had stopped, but the heavy clouds seemed reluctant to leave the skies over the small town. There was a skittish breeze blowing, and Sol Becker tightened the collar of his coat around his neck as he tried to keep up with the fast-stepping Dawes. They crossed the street diagonally and entered a two-story wooden building. Dawes took the stairs at a brisk pace and pushed open the door on the second floor. A fat man looked up from behind the desk. Hi, Charlie. Thought I'd like to see if you wanted to help move Brundage. The man batted his eyes. Oh, Brundage, he said. You know, I clean forgot about him. He laughed. Imagine me forgetting that. Yeah, Dawes wasn't amused. And you, Prince Regent. Ah, Willie. Well, come on. Stir that fat carcass. Gotta pick up Sheriff Coogan, too. This here gentleman has to see him about something else. The man regarded Sol suspiciously. Never seen you before, night or day. Stranger? Come on, Dawes said. The fat man grunted and hoisted himself out of the swivel chair. He followed lamely behind the two men as they went out into the street again. A woman with an empty market basket nodded casually to them. Morning, folks. Enjoyed it last night. Thought you made a right nice speech, Mr. Dawes. Thanks, Dawes answered gruffly, but obviously flattered. We were just going over to Brundage's to pick up the body. Ma's going to pay a call on Mrs. Brundage around ten o'clock. You care to visit? Why, I think that's very nice, the woman said. I'll be sure to do that. She smiled at the fat man. Morning, Prince. Sol's head was spinning. As they left the woman and continued their determined march down the quiet street, he tried to find answers. Look, Mr. Dawes, he was panting. The pace was fast. Does she dream about this Armagon, too, that woman back there? Yup. Charlie chuckled. He's a stranger, all right. And you, Mr. Saul turned to the fat man. You also know about this palace and everything? I told you, Dawes said testily. Charlie here's Prince Regent. But don't let the fancy title fool you. He's got no more power than any knight of the realm. He's just too dern fat to do much more than sit on a throne and eat grapes. That right, Charlie? The fat man giggled. Here's the sheriff, Dawes said. The sheriff, a sleepy-eyed citizen with a long, sad face, was rocking on a porch as they approached his house, trying to puff a half-lit pipe. He lifted one hand wearily when he saw them. Hi, Cookie, Dawes grinned. Thought you and me and Charlie would get Brundage's body out of the house. This here's Mr. Becker. He's got another problem. Mr. Becker, meet Cookie Coogan. The sheriff joined the procession, pausing only once to inquire into Saul's predicament. 
He described the hitchhiker incident, but Coogan listened stoically. He murmured something about the troopers and shuffled alongside the puffing fat man. Sol soon realized that their destination was a barber shop. Dawes cupped his hands over the plate glass and peered inside. Gold letters on the glass advertised haircut, shave, and massage parlor. He reported, Nobody in the shop. Must be upstairs. The fat man rang the bell. It was a while before an answer came. It was a reedy woman in a housecoat, her hair in curlers, her eyes red and swollen. Now, now, Dawes said gently, don't you take on like that, Mrs. Brundage. You heard the charges. It had to be this way. My poor Vincent, she sobbed. Better let us up, the sheriff said kindly. No use just letting him lay there, Mrs. Brundage. He didn't mean no harm, the woman snuffled. He was just purely ornery, Vincent was, just plain mean stubborn. The law's the law, the fat man sighed. Sol couldn't hold himself in. What law? Who's dead? How did it happen? Dawes looked at him disgustedly. Now is it any of your business? I mean, is it? I don't know, Sol said miserably. You better stay out of this, the sheriff warned. This is a local matter, young man. You better stay in the shop while we go up. They filed past him and the crying Mrs. Brundage. When they were out of sight, Sol pleaded with her. What happened? How did your husband die? Please! You must tell me. Was it something to do with Armagon? Do you dream about the place, too? She was shocked at the question. Of course. And your husband? Did he have the same dream? Fresh tears resulted. Can't you leave me alone? She turned her back. I, I got things to do. You could make yourself comfortable. She indicated the barber chairs and left through the back door. Saul looked after her, and then ambled over to the first chair and slipped into the high seat. His reflection in the mirror, strangely gray in the dim light, made him groan. His clothes were a mess, and he needed a shave. If only Brundage had been alive. He leaped out of a chair as voices sounded behind the door. Dawes was kicking it open with his foot, his arms laden with two rather large feet, still encased in bedroom slippers. Charlie was at the other end of the burden, which appeared to be a middle-aged man in pajamas. The sheriff followed the trio up with a sad undertaker expression. Behind him came Mrs. Brundage, properly weeping. "'We'll take him to the funeral parlor,' Dawes said, breathing hard. "'Weighs a ton, don't he?' "'What killed him?' Sol said. "'Heart attack?' The fat man chuckled. The tableau was grisly. Saul looked away towards the comfortingly mundane atmosphere of the barber shop, but even the sight of the thick padded chairs, the shaving mugs on the wall, the neat rows of cutting instruments, seemed grotesque and morbid. Listen, Saul said as they went through the doorway, about my car. The sheriff turned and regarded him lugubriously. Your car? Young man, ain't you got no respect? Saul swallowed hard and fell silent. He went outside with them the woman slamming the barbershop door behind him. He waited in front of the building while the men toted away the corpse to some new destination. He took a walk. The town was just coming to life. People were strolling out of their houses, commenting on the weather, chuckling amiably about local affairs. Kids on bicycles were beginning to appear, jangling the little bells and hooting to each other. A woman hanging wash in the backyard called out to him, thinking he was somebody else. He found a little park, no more than twenty yards in circumference, centered around a weather-beaten monument of some unrecognizable military figure. Three old men took their places on the bench that circled the general, and leaned on their canes. Saul was a civil engineer, but he made like a reporter. "'Pardon me, sir,' the old man, leathery-faced with a fine yellow mustache, looked at him dumbly. "'Have you ever heard of Armagon?' "'You a stranger?' "'Yes.' Thought so. Saul repeated the question. Course I did. Been going there ever since I was a kid. Night times, that is. How? I mean, what kind of a place is it? Said you're a stranger? Yes. Then taint your business. That was that. He left the park and wandered into a thriving luncheonette. He tried questioning the man behind the counter who merely snickered and said, You staying with the Dawses, ain't you? Better ask Willie, then. He knows the place better than anybody. He asked about the execution, and the man stiffened. Don't think I can talk about that. Fella broke one of the laws. That's about it. 
Don't see where you come into it. At eleven o'clock he returned to the Dawes residence and found Mom in the kitchen, surrounded by the warm, nostalgic odor of home-baked bread. She told him that her husband had left a message for the stranger, informing him that the state police would be around to get his story. He waited in the house, gloomily turning the pages of the local newspaper, searching for references to Armagon. He found nothing. At eleven-thirty a brown-faced state trooper came to call, and Saul told his story. He was promised nothing and told to stay in town until he was contacted again by the authorities. Mom fixed him a light lunch, the greatest feature of which was some hot biscuits she plucked out of the oven. It made him feel almost normal. He wandered around the town some more after lunch trying to spark conversation with the residents. He learned little. At five-thirty he returned to the Dawes house and was promptly leaped upon by little Sally. Hi, 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 she said, clutching his right leg and almost toppling him over. We had a party in school. I had chocolate cake. You going to stay with us? Just another night, Saul told her, trying to shake the girl off. If it's okay with your folks, they haven't found my car yet. Sally! Mom was peering out of the screen door. You let Mr. Becker alone and go wash. Your pa will be home soon. Oh, poo, the girl said, her pigtail swinging. Do you got a girlfriend, mister? No, Saul struggled towards the house with her dead weight on his leg. Would you mind? I can't walk. Would you be my boyfriend? Well, we'll talk about it if you let go of my leg. Inside the house, she said, We're having pot roast. You stayin'? Of course Mr. Becker's stayin', Mom said. He's our guest. That's very kind of you, Saul said. I really wish you'd let me pay for something. Don't want to hear another word about pay. Mr. Dawes came home an hour later, looking tired. Mom pecked him lightly on the forehead. He glanced at the evening paper and then spoke to Saul. Here you've been asking questions, Mr. Becker. Saul nodded, embarrassed. Guess I have. I'm awfully curious about this Armagon place. Never heard of anything like it before. Dawes grunted. You ain't a reporter? Oh, no, I'm an engineer. I was just satisfying my own curiosity. Uh-huh. Dawes looked reflective. You wouldn't be thinking about writing us up or anything. I mean, this is a pretty private affair. Writing it up? Sol blinked. I hadn't thought of it, but you'll have to admit it's sure interesting. Yeah, Dawes said narrowly. I guess it would be. Supper, Mom called. After the meal they spent a quiet evening at home. Sally went to bed screaming her reluctance at 8.30. Mom, dozing in the big chair near the fireplace, padded upstairs at 9. Then Dawes yawned widely and stood up and said good night at quarter of ten. He paused in the doorway before leaving. I'd think about that, he said. Writing it up, I mean. A lot of folks would think you were just plumb crazy. Saul laughed feebly. I, I guess they would at that. Good night, Dawes said. Good night. He read Sally's copy of Treasure Island for about half an hour. Then he undressed, made himself comfortable on the sofa, snuggled under the soft blanket that Mom had provided, and shut his eyes. He reviewed the events of the day before dropping off to sleep. The troublesome Sally, the strange dream world of Armagon, the visit to the barber shop, the removal of Brundage's body, the conversations with the townspeople, Dawes's suspicious attitude. Then sleep came. He was flanked by marble pillars thrusting toward a high-domed ceiling. The room stretched long and wide before him, the walls bedecked in stunning purple draperies. He whirled at the sound of footsteps echoing stridently on the stone floor. Someone was running towards him. It was Sally, pigtails streaming out behind her, the small body wearing a flowing white toga. She was shrieking, laughing as she skittered past him, clutching a gleaming gold helmet. He called out to her, but she was too busy outdistancing her pursuer. It was Sheriff Coogan puffing and huffing, the metal and gold cloth uniform ludicrous on his lanky frame. Consarn kid, he wheezed. Give me my hat. Mom was following him, her stout body regal in scarlet robes. Sally, you give Mr. Coogan his helmet, you hear? Mrs. Dawes, Saul said. Why, Mr. Becker, how nice to see you again. Pa, Pa, look who's here. Willie Dawes appeared. No, Saul thought. This was King Dawes. Nothing else could explain the magnificence of his attire. Yes, Dawes said craftily. So I see. Welcome to Armagon, Mr. Becker. Armagon, Saul gaped. 
Then this is the place you've been dreaming about? Yup, the king said. And now you're in it, too. Then I'm only dreaming? Charlie, the fat man, clumsy as ever in his robes of state, said, So that's the snooper, eh? Yup, Dawes chuckled. Think you better round up the knights. Saul said, The knights? Exelution, exelution, Sally shrieked. Now wait a minute. Charlie shouted. Running feet, clanging of armor, Saul backed up against a pillar. Now look here, you've gone far enough. Not quite, said the king. The knight stepped forward. Wait, Saul screamed. Familiar faces under shining helmets moved towards him, the tips of sharp pointed spears gleaming wickedly. And Saul Becker wondered, would he ever wake up? End of Dreamtown by Henry Sleesar The Facts in the Case of M. Valdemar by Edgar Allan Poe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite The Facts in the Case of M. Valdemar by Edgar Allan Poe Of course, I shall not pretend to consider it any matter for wonder that the extraordinary case of M. Valdemar has excited discussion. It would have been a miracle had it not, especially under the circumstances. Through the desire of all parties concerned to keep the affair from the public, at least for the present, or until we had farther opportunities for investigation, through our endeavors to effect this, a garbled or exaggerated account made its way into society and became the source of many unpleasant misrepresentations, and, very naturally, of a great deal of disbelief. It is now rendered necessary that I give the facts as far as I comprehend them myself. They are succinctly these. My attention for the last three years has been repeatedly drawn to the subject of mesmerism and about nine months ago it occurred to me quite suddenly that in the series of experiments made hitherto there had been a very remarkable and most unaccountable omission. No person had as yet been mesmerized in articulo mortis. It remained to be seen first whether in such condition there existed in the patient any susceptibility to the magnetic influence, secondly whether if any existed it was impaired or increased by the condition. Thirdly, to what extent or for how long a period the encroachments of death might be arrested by the process. There were other points to be ascertained, but these most excited my curiosity. The last in especial, from the immensely important character of its consequences. In looking around me for some subject by whose means I might test these particulars, I was brought to think of my friend M. Ernest Valdemar, the well-known compiler of the Bibliotheca Forensica and author, under the nom de plume of Issachar Marx, of the Polish versions of Wallenstein and Gargantua. M. Valdemar, who has resided principally at Harlem, New York, since the year 1839, is, or was, particularly noticeable for the extreme spareness of his person, his lower limbs much resembling those of John Randolph, and also for the whiteness of his whiskers in violent contrast to the blackness of his hair the latter in consequence being very generally mistaken for a wig. His temperament was markedly nervous and rendered him a good subject for mesmeric experiment. On two or three occasions I had put him to sleep with little difficulty, but was disappointed in other results which his peculiar constitution had naturally led me to anticipate. His will was at no period positively or thoroughly under my control, and in regard to clairvoyance I could accomplish with him nothing to be relied upon. I always attributed my failure at these points to the disordered state of his health. For some months previous to my becoming acquainted with him his physicians had declared him in a confirmed pithesis. It was his custom, indeed, to speak calmly of his approaching dissolution, as of a matter neither to be avoided nor regretted. When the ideas to which I have alluded first occurred to me, it was of course very natural that I should think of M. Valdemar. I knew the steady philosophy of the man too well to apprehend any scruples from him, and he had no relatives in America who would be likely to interfere. 
I spoke to him frankly upon the subject, and to my surprise his interest seemed vividly excited. I say to my surprise, for although he had always yielded his person freely to my experiments, he had never before given me any tokens of sympathy with what I did. His disease was, if that character which would admit of exact calculation in respect to the epoch of its termination in death, and it was finally arranged between us that he would send for me about twenty-four hours before the period announced by his physicians as that of his decease. It is now rather more than seven months since I received from M. Valdemar himself the subjoined note. My dear P., you may as well come now. D. and F. are agreed that I cannot hold out beyond tomorrow midnight, and I think they have hit the time very nearly. Valdemar. I received this note within half an hour after it was written, and in fifteen minutes more I was in the dying man's chamber. I had not seen him for ten days, and was appalled by the fearful alteration which the brief interval had wrought in him. His face wore a leaden hue, the eyes were utterly lusterless, and the emaciation was so extreme that the skin had been broken through by the cheekbones. His expectoration was excessive, the pulse was barely perceptible. He retained, nevertheless, in a very remarkable manner, both his mental power and a certain degree of physical strength. He spoke with distinctness, took some palliative medicines without aid, and when I entered the room was occupied in penciling memoranda in a pocket-book. He was propped up in the bed by pillows. Doctors D and F were in attendance. After pressing Valdemar's hand I took these gentlemen aside and obtained from them a minute account of the patient's condition. The left lung had been for eighteen months in a semi-osseous and cartilaginous state, and was, of course, entirely useless for all purposes of vitality. The right in its upper portion was also partially, if not thoroughly, ossified, while the lower region was merely a mass of purulent tubercles, running one into another. Several extensive perforations existed, and at one point permanent adhesion to the ribs had taken place. These appearances in the right lobe were of comparatively recent date. The ossification had proceeded with very unusual rapidity. No sign of it had been discovered a month before, and the adhesion had only been observed during the three previous days. Independently of the pithesis, the patient was suspected of aneurysm of the aorta, but on this point the osseous symptoms rendered an exact diagnosis impossible. It was the opinion of both physicians that M. Valdemar would die about midnight on the morrow, Sunday. It was then seven o'clock on Saturday evening. On quitting the invalid's bedside to hold conversation with myself, doctors D and F had bidden him a final farewell. It had not been their intention to return, but at my request they agreed to look in upon the patient about ten the next night. When they had gone I spoke freely with M. Valdemar on the subject of his approaching dissolution, as well as more particularly of the experiment proposed. He still professed himself quite willing and even anxious to have it made, and urged me to commence it at once. A male and female nurse were in attendance, but I did not feel myself altogether at liberty to engage in a task of this character with no more reliable witnesses than these people, in case of sudden accident, might prove. I therefore postponed operations until about eight the next night, when the arrival of a medical student with whom I had some acquaintance, Mr. Theodore L. I., relieved me from farther embarrassment. It had been my design originally to wait for the physicians, but I was induced to proceed first by the urgent entreaties of M. Valdemar, and secondly by my conviction that I had not a moment to lose, as he was evidently sinking fast. Mr. L. I. was so kind as to accede to my desire that he would take notes of all that occurred, and it is from his memoranda that what I have now to relate is, for the most part, either condensed or copied verbatim. It was about five minutes of eight when, taking the patient's hand, I begged him to state as distinctly as he could to Mr. L. I. whether he, M. Valdemar, was entirely willing that I should make the experiment of mesmerizing him in his then condition. He replied feebly, yet quite audibly, Yes, I wish to be. I, I fear you have mesmerized, adding immediately afterwards, deferred it too long. While he spoke thus, I commenced the passes which I had already found most effectual in subduing him. He was evidently influenced with the first lateral stroke of my hand across his forehead, but although I exerted all my powers, no farther perceptible effect was induced, until some minutes after ten o'clock when doctors D and F called, according to appointment. 
I explained to them in a few words what I designed, and as they opposed no objection, saying that the patient was already in the death agony, I proceeded without hesitation, exchanging, however, the lateral passes for downward ones, and directing my gaze entirely into the right eye of the sufferer. By this time his pulse was imperceptible, and his breathing was stertorous, and at intervals of half a minute. This condition was nearly unaltered for a quarter of an hour. At the expiration of this period, however, a natural, although a very deep, sigh escaped the bosom of the dying man, and the stertorous breathing ceased. That is to say, its stertorousness was no longer apparent. The intervals were undiminished. The patient's extremities were of an icy coldness. At five minutes before eleven I perceived unequivocal signs of the mesmeric influence. The glassy roll of the eye was changed for that expression of uneasy inward examination which is never seen except in cases of sleep-walking, and which it is quite impossible to mistake. With a few rapid lateral passes I made the lids quiver, as an incipient sleep, and with a few more I closed them altogether. I was not satisfied, however, with this, but continued the manipulations vigorously, and with the fullest exertion of the will until I had completely stiffened the limbs of the slumberer, after placing them in a seemingly easy position. The legs were at full length, the arms were nearly so, and reposed on the bed at a moderate distance from the loin. The head was very slightly elevated. When I had accomplished this, it was fully midnight, and I requested the gentleman present to examine M. Valdemar's condition. After a few experiments they admitted him to be in an unusually perfect state of mesmeric trance. The curiosity of both the physicians was greatly excited. Dr. D. resolved at once to remain with the patient all night, while Dr. F. took leave with a promise to return at daybreak. Mr. L. I. and the nurses remained. We left M. Valdemar entirely undisturbed until about three o'clock in the morning, when I approached him and found him in precisely the same condition as when Dr. F. went away. That is to say, he lay in the same position. The pulse was imperceptible, the breathing was gentle scarcely noticeable unless through the application of a mirror to the lips. The eyes were closed naturally, and the limbs were as rigid and as cold as marble. Still, the general appearance was certainly not that of death. As I approached M. Valdemar I made a kind of half-effort to influence his right arm into pursuit of my own, as I passed the latter gently to and fro above his person. In such experiments with this patient I had never perfectly succeeded before, and assuredly I had little thought of succeeding now. But to my astonishment his arm very readily, although feebly, followed every direction I assigned it with mine. I determined to hazard a few words of conversation. M. Valdemar, I said, are you asleep? He made no answer, but I perceived a tremor about the lips, and was thus induced to repeat the question again and again. At its third repetition his whole frame was agitated by a very slight shivering. The eyelids unclosed themselves so far as to display a white line of the ball. The lips moved sluggishly, and from between them, in a barely audible whisper, issued the words, Yes, asleep now. Do not wake me. Let me die so. I here felt the limbs and found them as rigid as ever. The right arm, as before, obeyed the direction of my hand. I questioned the sleep-waker again. Do you still feel pain in the breast, M. Valdemar? The answer was now immediate, but even less audible than before. No pain. I am dying. I did not think it advisable to disturb him farther just then, and nothing more was said or done until the arrival of Dr. F., who came a little before sunrise and expressed unbounded astonishment at finding the patient still alive. After feeling the pulse and applying a mirror to the lips, he requested me to speak to the sleep-waker again. I did so, saying, M. Valdemar, do you still sleep? As before, some minutes elapsed ere a reply was made, and during the interval the dying man seemed to be collecting his energies to speak. At my fourth repetition of the question he said very faintly, almost inaudibly, Yes, still asleep, dying. It was now the opinion, or rather the wish, of the physicians that M. Valdemar should be suffered to remain undisturbed in his present apparently tranquil condition, until death should supervene, and this, it was generally agreed, must now take place within a few minutes. I concluded, however, to speak to him once more, and merely repeated my previous question. 
While I spoke there came a marked change over the countenance of the sleep-waker. The eyes rolled themselves slowly open, the pupils disappearing upwardly. The skin generally assumed a cadaverous hue, resembling not so much parchment as white paper, and these circular hectic spots which hitherto had been strongly defined in the center of each cheek went out at once. I use this expression because the suddenness of their departure put me in mind of nothing so much as the extinguishment of a candle by a puff of the breath. The upper lip at the same time writhed itself away from the teeth which it had previously covered completely while the lower jaw fell with an audible jerk, leaving the mouth widely extended and disclosing in full view the swollen and blackened tongue. I presume that no member of the party then present had been unaccustomed to deathbed horrors, but so hideous beyond conception was the appearance of M. Valdemar at this moment that there was a general shrinking back from the region of the bed. I now feel that I have reached a point in this narrative at which every reader will be startled into positive disbelief. It is my business, however, simply to proceed. There was no longer the faintest sign of vitality in M. Valdemar, and concluding him to be dead we were consigning him to the charge of the nurses when a strong vibratory motion was observable in the tongue. This continued for perhaps a minute. At the expiration of this period there issued from the distended and motionless jaws a voice, such as it would be madness in me to attempt describing. There are, indeed, two or three epithets which might be considered as applicable to it. In part, I might say, for example, that the sound was harsh and broken and hollow. But the hideous whole is indescribable, for the simple reason that no similar sounds have ever jarred upon the ear of humanity. There were two particulars, nevertheless, which I thought then, and still think, might fairly be stated as characteristic of the intonation, as well as adapted to convey some idea of its unearthly peculiarity. In the first place the voice seemed to reach our ears, at least mine, from a vast distance, or from some deep cavern within the earth. In the second place it impressed me, I fear indeed that it will be impossible to make myself comprehended as gelatinous or glutinous matters impress the sense of touch. I have spoken both of sound and of voice. I mean to say that the sound was one of distinct, or even wonderfully thrillingly distinct, syllabification. M. Valdemar spoke, obviously in reply to the question I had propounded to him a few minutes before. I had asked him, it will be remembered, if he still slept. He now said, Yes. No. I have been sleeping, and now, now, I am dead." No person present even affected to deny or attempt to repress the unutterable shuddering horror which these few words thus uttered were so well calculated to convey. Mr. L. I., the student, swooned. The nurses immediately left the chamber and could not be induced to return. My own impressions I would not pretend to render intelligible to the reader. For nearly an hour we busied ourselves silently, without the utterance of a word, in endeavors to revive Mr. L. I. When he came to himself, we addressed ourselves again to an investigation of M. Valdemar's condition. It remained in all respects as I have last described it, with the exception that the mirror no longer afforded evidence of respiration. An attempt to draw blood from the arm failed. I should mention, too, that this limb was no farther subject to my will. I endeavored in vain to make it follow the direction of my hand. The only real indication, indeed, of the mesmeric influence was now found in the vibratory movement of the tongue. Whenever I addressed M. Valdemar a question, he seemed to be making an effort to reply, but had no longer sufficient volition. To queries put to him by any other person than myself he seemed utterly insensible, although I endeavored to place each member of the company in mesmeric rapport with him. I believe that I have now related all that is necessary to an understanding of the sleep-waker's state at this epoch. Other nurses were procured, and at ten o'clock I left the house in company with the two physicians and Mr. L. I. In the afternoon we all called again to see the patient. His condition remained precisely the same. We had now some discussion as to the propriety and feasibility of awakening him, but we had little difficulty in agreeing that no good purpose would be served by doing so. It was evident that so far death, or what is usually termed death, had been arrested by the mesmeric process. It seemed clear to us that to awaken M. Valdemar would merely be to ensure his instant or at least his speedy dissolution. 
From this period until the close of last week, an interval of nearly seven months, we continued to make daily calls at M. Valdemar's house, accompanied now and then by medical and other friends. All this time the sleep-waker remained exactly as I have last described him. The nurse's attentions were continual. It was on Friday last that we finally resolved to make the experiment of awakening or attempting to awaken him, and it is the, perhaps, unfortunate result of this latter experiment which has given rise to so much discussion in private circles, to so much of what I cannot help thinking unwarranted popular feeling. For the purpose of relieving M. Valdemar from the mesmeric trance I made use of the customary passes. These for a time were unsuccessful. The first indication of revival was afforded by a partial descent of the iris. It was observed as especially remarkable that this lowering of the pupil was accompanied by the profuse outflowing of a yellowish ichor from beneath the lids of a pungent and highly offensive odor. It was now suggested that I should attempt to influence the patient's arm, as heretofore. I made the attempt and failed. Dr. F. then intimated a desire to have me put a question. I did so as follows. M. Valdemar, can you explain to us what are your feelings or wishes now?" There was an instant return of the hectic circles on the cheeks. The tongue quivered, or rather rolled violently in the mouth, although the jaws and lips remained rigid as before. And at length the same hideous voice which I have already described broke forth. "'For God's sake, quick, quick, put me to sleep! Or, quick, waken me, quick, I say to you that I am dead!' I was thoroughly unnerved, and for an instant remained undecided what to do. At first I made an endeavor to recompose the patient, but failing in this, through total abeyance of the will, I retraced my steps, and as earnestly struggled to awaken him. In this attempt I soon saw that I should be successful, or at least I soon fancied that my success would be complete, and I am sure that all in the room were prepared to see the patient awaken. For what really occurred, however, it is quite impossible that any human being could have been prepared. As I rapidly made the mesmeric passes, amid ejaculations of, Dead! Dead! Absolutely bursting from the tongue and not from the lips of the sufferer, his whole frame at once, within the space of a single minute or even less, shrunk, crumbled, absolutely rotted away beneath my hands, upon the bed, before that whole company. There lay a nearly liquid mass of loathsome, of detestable putridity. End of The Facts in the Case of M. Valdemar by Edgar Allan Poe The Francis Spate by Jack London This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times The Francis Spate by Jack London The Francis Spate was running before it solely under a mizzen topsail when the thing happened. It was not due to carelessness, so much as to the lack of discipline of the crew, and to the fact that they were indifferent seamen, at best. The man at the wheel, in particular, a limerick man, had had no experience with salt water, beyond that of rafting timber on the Shannon, between the Quebec vessels and the shore. He was afraid of the huge seas that rose out of the murk astern, and bore down upon him, and he was more given to cowering away from their threatened impact than he was to meeting their blows with the wheel and checking the ship's rush to broach to. It was three in the morning when his unseamanlike conduct precipitated the catastrophe. At sight of a sea far larger than its fellows, he crouched down, releasing his hands from the spokes. The Francis Spate sheared as her stern lifted on the sea, receiving the full fling of the cap on her quarter. The next instant she was in the trough, her lee rail buried till the ocean was level with her hatch combings, sea after sea breaking over her weather rail and sweeping what remained exposed of the deck with icy deluges. The men were out of hand, helpless and hopeless, stupid in their bewilderment and fear, and resolute only in that they would not obey orders.
Some wailed, others clung silently in the weather shrouds, and still others muttered prayers or shrieked vile imprecations, and neither captain nor mate could get them to bear a hand at the pumps or at setting patches of sails to bring the vessel up to the wind and sea. Inside the hour the ship was over on her beam ends, the lubberly cowards climbing up her side and hanging on in the rigging. When she went over, the mate was caught and drowned in the after-cabin, as were two sailors who had sought refuge in the forecastle. The mate had been the ablest man on board, and the captain was now scarcely less helpless than his men. Beyond cursing them for their worthlessness, he did nothing, and it remained for a man named Mahoney, a Belfast man, and a boy, O'Brien, of Limerick, to cut away the fore and main masts. This they did at great risk, on the perpendicular wall of the wreck, sending the mizzen top mast overside along in the general crash. The Francis Spate righted, and it was well that she was lumber-laden, else she would have sunk, for she was already waterlogged. The mainmast, still fast by the shrouds, beat like a thunderous sledge-hammer against the ship's side, every stroke bringing groans from the men. Day dawned on the savage ocean, and in the cold gray light all that could be seen of the Francis Spate emerging from the sea were the poop, the shattered mizzenmast, and a ragged line of bulwarks. It was midwinter in the North Atlantic, and the wretched men were half dead from cold, but there was no place where they could find rest. Every sea breached clean over the wreck washing away the salt encrustations from their bodies, and depositing fresh encrustations. The cabin under the poop was awash to the knees, but here at least was shelter from the chill wind, and here the survivors congregated, standing upright, holding on by the cabin furnishings, and leaning against one another for support. In vain Mahoney strove to get the men to take turns in watching aloft from the mizzenmast for any chance vessel. The icy gale was too much for them, and they preferred the shelter of the cabin. O'Brien, the boy, who was only fifteen, took turns with Mahoney on the freezing perch. It was the boy, at three in the afternoon, who called down that he had sighted a sail. This did bring them from the cabin, and they crowded the poop-rail and weather-mizzen shrouds as they watched the strange ship. But its course did not lie near, and when it disappeared below the skyline they returned shivering to the cabin, not one offering to relieve the watch at the masthead. By the end of the second day Mahoney and O'Brien gave up their attempt, and thereafter the vessel drifted in the gale uncared for and without a lookout. There were thirteen alive, and for seventy-two hours they stood knee-deep in the sloshing water on the cabin floor, half-frozen, without food, and with but three bottles of wine shared among them. All food and fresh water were below, and there was no getting at such supplies in the waterlogged condition of the wreck. As the days went by, no food whatever passed their lips. Fresh water, in small quantities, they were able to obtain by holding a cover of a tureen under the saddle of the mizzenmast, but the rain fell infrequently, and they were hard put. When it rained, they also soaked their handkerchiefs, squeezing them out into their mouths, or into their shoes. As the wind and sea went down, they were even able to mop the exposed portions of the deck that were free from brine, and so add to their water supply. But food they had none, and no way of getting it, though seabirds flew repeatedly overhead. In the calm weather that followed the gale, after having remained on their feet for ninety-six hours, they were able to find dry planks in the cabin on which to lie. But the long hours of standing in the salt water had caused sores to form on their legs. These sores were extremely painful. The slightest contact or scrape caused severe anguish and in their weak condition and crowded situation they were continually hurting one another in this manner. 
Not a man could move without being followed by volleys of abuse, curses, and groans. So great was their misery that the strong oppressed the weak, shoving them aside from the dry planks to shift for themselves in the cold and wet. The boy, O'Brien, was specially maltreated. Though there were three other boys, it was O'Brien who came in for most of the abuse. There was no explaining it, except on the ground that he was a stronger and more dominant spirit than those of the other boys, and that he stood up more for his rights, resenting the petty injustices that were meted out to all the boys by the men. Whenever O'Brien came near the men in search of a dry place to sleep, or merely moved about, he was kicked and cuffed away. In return, he cursed them for their selfish brutishness, and blows and kicks and curses were rained upon him. Miserable as were all of them, he was thus made far more miserable, and it was only the flame of life, unusually strong in him, that enabled him to endure. As the days went by, and they grew weaker, their peevishness and ill-temper increased, which, in turn, increased the ill-treatment and sufferings of O'Brien. By the sixteenth day, all hands were far gone with hunger, and they stood together in small groups, talking in undertones, and occasionally glancing at O'Brien. It was at high noon that the conference came to a head. The captain was the spokesman. All were collected on the poop. Men, the captain began, we have been a long time without food. Two weeks and two days, it is, though it seems more like two years and two months. We can't hang out much longer. It is beyond human nature to go on hanging out with nothing in our stomachs. There is a serious question to consider, whether it is better for all to die, or for one to die. We are standing with our feet in our graves. If one of us dies, the rest may live until a ship is sighted. What say you? Michael Behane, the man who had been at the wheel when the Francis Spate broached to, called out that it was well. The others joined in the cry. Let it be one of the boys, cried Sullivan, a Tarbert man, glancing at the same time significantly at O'Brien. It is my opinion, the captain went on, that it will be a good deed for one of us to die for the rest. A good deed, a good deed, the men interjected. And it is my opinion that tis best for one of the boys to die. They have no families to support, nor would they be considered so great a loss to their friends as those who have wives and children. Tis right, very right, very fit, it should be done, the men muttered one to another. But the four boys cried out against the injustice of it. Our lives is just as dear to us as the rest of yez, O'Brien protested, and our families, too. As for wives and children, who is there saving meself to care for me old mother that's a widow, as ye know, well, Michael Behane, that comes from Limerick, tis not fair. Let the lots be drawn between all of us, men and boys. Mahoney was the only man who spoke in favor of the boys, declaring that it was the fair thing for all to share alike. Sullivan and the captain insisted on the drawing of lots being confined to the boys. There were high words, in the midst of which Sullivan turned upon O'Brien, snarling, "'Twould be a good deed to put you out of the way. You deserve it. Twould be the right way to serve you, and serve you we will." He started toward O'Brien, with intent to lay hands on him, and proceed at once with the killing, while several others likewise shuffled toward him and reached for him. He stumbled backwards to escape them, at the same time crying that he would submit to the drawing of the lots among the boys. The captain prepared four sticks of different lengths, and handed them to Sullivan. "'You're thinking the drawing will not be fair,' the latter sneered to O'Brien. "'So it's yourself will do the drawing.' To this O'Brien agreed. A handkerchief was tied over his eyes, blindfolding him, and he knelt down on the deck with his back to Sullivan. "'Whoever you name for the shortest stick'll die,' the captain said. Sullivan held up one of the sticks. 
The rest were concealed in his hand, so that no one could see whether it was the short stick or not. "'And whose stick will it be?' Sullivan demanded. "'For little Johnny Sheehan,' O'Brien answered. Sullivan laid the stick aside. Those who looked could not tell if it were the fatal one. Sullivan held up another stick. "'Whose will it be?' "'For George Burns,' was the reply. The stick was laid with the first one, and a third held up. "'And whose is this one?' "'For myself,' said O'Brien. With a quick movement, Sullivan threw the four sticks together. No one had seen. "'Tis for yourself ye've drawn it,' Sullivan announced. "'A good deed,' several of the men muttered. O'Brien was very quiet. He arose to his feet, took the bandage off, and looked around. "'Where is it?' he demanded. "'The short stick, the one for me.' The captain pointed to the four sticks lying on the deck. "'How do you know the stick was mine?' O'Brien questioned. "'Did you see it, Johnny Sheehan?' Johnny Sheehan, who was the youngest of the boys, did not answer. "'Did you see it?' O'Brien next asked Mahoney. "'No, I didn't see it.' The men were muttering and growling. "'Twas a fair drawing,' Sullivan said. "'Ye had your chance, and ye lost. That's all if at. "'A fair drawing,' the captain added. "'Didn't I behold it myself? The stick was yours, O'Brien, and ye may as well get ready. Where's the cook? Gorman, come here. Fetch the tureen cover. Some of ye, Gorman, do your duty like a man.' "'But how'll I do it?' the cook demanded. He was a weak-eyed, weak-chinned, indecisive man. "'Tis a damn murder!' O'Brien cried out. "'I'll have none of it,' Mahoney announced. "'Not a bite shall pass me lips.' "'Then tis your share for better men than yourself,' Sullivan sneered. "'Go on with your duty, cook.' "'Tis not me duty, the killing of boys.' Gorman protested irresolutely. "'If yez don't make mate for us, we'll be making mate of yourself,' Behane threatened. "'Somebody must die, and as well you as an another.' Johnny Sheehan began to cry. O'Brien listened anxiously. His face was pale, his lips trembled, and at times his whole body shook. "'I signed on as cook,' Gorman announced. A cook I would, if golly there was, but I'll not lay me hands to murder. Tis not in the articles. I'm the cook. And cook you'll be for one minute more only, Sullivan said grimly, at the same moment gripping the cook's head from behind and bending it back to the windpipe and jugular were stretched taut. Where's your knife, Mike? Pass it along. At the touch of the steel, Gorman whimpered. I'll do it, if yez hold the boy. The pitiable condition of the cook seemed in some fashion to nerve up O'Brien. It's all right, Gorman, he said. Go on with it. Tis meself knows you're not wanting to do it. It's all right, sir. This did the captain, who had laid a hand heavily on his arm. You won't have to hold me, sir. I'll stand still. "'Stop your blithering, and a go get that tureen cover,' Behane commanded Johnny Sheehan, at the same time dealing him a heavy cuff alongside the head. The boy, who was scarcely more than a child, fetched the cover. He crawled and tottered along the deck, so weak was he from hunger. The tears still ran down his cheeks. Behane took the cover from him, at the same time administering another cuff. O'Brien took off his coat, and bared his right arm. His underlip still trembled, but he held a tight grip on himself. The captain's penknife was opened and passed to Gorman. Mahoney, tell me, mother, what happened to me, if ever ye get back, O'Brien requested. Mahoney nodded. "'Tis black murder, black and damned,' he said. "'The boy's flesh do none of yez any good. Mark me words.' 
"'You'll not profit by it, none of these.' "'Get ready,' the captain ordered. "'You, Sullivan, hold the cover. "'That's it. Close up. Spill nothing. It's precious stuff.' Gorman made an effort. The knife was dull. He was weak. Besides, his hand was shaking so violently that he nearly dropped the knife. The three boys were crouched apart, in a huddle, crying and sobbing. With the exception of Mahoney, the men were gathered about the victim, craning their necks to see. "'Be a man, Gorman,' the captain cautioned. The wretched cook was seized with a spasm of resolution, sawing back and forth with the blade on O'Brien's wrist. The veins were severed. Sullivan held the terrine cover close underneath. The cut veins gaped wide, but no ruddy flood gushed forth. There was no blood at all. The veins were dry and empty. No one spoke. The grim and silent figures swayed in unison with each heave of the ship. Every eye was turned fixedly upon that inconceivable and monstrous thing, the dry veins of a creature that was alive. "'Tis a warning!' Mahoney cried. "'Lave the boy alone! Mark me words! His death'll do none of his any good! "'Try at the elbow! The left elbow! "'Tis nearer the heart!' the captain said finally, in a dim and husky voice that was unlike his own. "'Give me the knife,' O'Brien said, roughly, taking it out of the cook's hand. "'I can't be looking at ye putting me to hurt.' Quite coolly he cut the vein of the left elbow, but, like the cook, he failed to bring blood. "'This is all of no use,' Sullivan said. "'Tis better to put him out of his misery by bleeding him at the throat.' The strain had been too much for the lad. "'Don't be doing it," he cried. "'There'll be no blood in me throat. Give me a little more time. "'Tis cold and weak I am. Be letting me lay down and sleep a bit. Then I'll be warm and the blood will flow. "'Tis no use,' Sullivan objected. "'As if ye could be sleeping at a time like this. Ye'll not sleep, and ye'll not warm up. Look at ye now. You've an ague.' "'I was sick at Limerick one night,' O'Brien hurried on, "'and the doctor couldn't bleed me. But after sleeping, a few hours, and getting warm in bed, the blood came freely. It's God's truth I'm telling yous. Don't be murdering me. His veins are open now, the captain said. Tis no use leaving him in his pain. Do it now and be done with it. They started to reach for O'Brien, but he backed away. I'll be the death of yous, he screamed. Take your hands off of me, Sullivan. I'll come back. I'll haunt yous, waking or sleeping. I'll haunt yous till you die. Tis disgraceful, yelled Behan. If the short stick had been mine, I'd a let me mates cut the head off of me, and died happy. Sullivan leaped in, and caught the unhappy lad by the hair. The rest of the men followed. O'Brien kicked and struggled, snarling and snapping at the hands that clutched him from every side. Little Johnny Sheehan broke out into wild screaming, but the men took no notice of him. O'Brien was bent backward to the deck, the terrain cover under his neck. Gorman was shoved forward. Someone had thrust a large sheath knife into his hand. "'Do your duty! Do your duty!' the men cried. The cook bent over, but he caught the boy's eyes and faltered. "'If you don't, I'll kill ye with me own hands!' Behan shouted. From every side a torrent of abuse and threats poured in upon the cook. Still he hung back. "'Maybe there'll be more blood in his veins than O'Brien's,' Sullivan suggested significantly. Behane caught Gorman by the hair and twisted his head back, while Sullivan attempted to take possession of the sheath knife, but Gorman clung to it desperately. "'Let go, and I'll do it!' he screamed frantically. Don't be cutting me throat. I'll do the deed. I'll do the deed. See that you do it, then, the captain threatened him. Gorman allowed himself to be shoved forward. He looked at the boy, closed his eyes, and muttered a prayer. 
Then, without opening his eyes, he did the deed that had been appointed him. O'Brien emitted a shriek that sank swiftly to a gurgling sob. The men held him till his struggles ceased, when he was laid upon the deck. They were eager and impatient, and with oaths and threats they urged Gorman to hurry with the preparation of the meal. "'Lave it, you bloody butchers!' Mahoney said quietly. "'Lave it, I tell yous. You'll not be needing any of it now. Tis as I said, you'll not be profiting by the lad's blood. Empty it over a side. Behan, empty it over a side.' Behane, still holding the terrain cover in both his hands, glanced to windward. He walked to the rail and threw the cover and contents into the sea. A full-rigged ship was bearing down upon them a short mile away. So occupied had they been with the deed just committed that none had had eyes for a lookout. All hands watched her coming on, the brightly coppered forefoot parting the water like a golden knife the head-sails flapping lazily and emptily at each downward surge, and the towering canvas tiers dipping and curtsying with each stately swing of the sea. No man spoke. As she hove to, a cable length away, the captain of the Francis Spate bestirred himself and ordered a tarpaulin to be thrown over O'Brien's corpse. A boat was lowered from the stranger's side and began to pull toward them, John Gorman laughed. He laughed softly at first, but he accompanied each stroke of the oars with spasmodically increasing glee. It was this maniacal laughter that greeted the rescue boat as it hauled alongside, and the first officer clambered on board. End of The Francis Spate by Jack London Lazarus by Leonid Andreev, translated by Abraham Yarmolinsky. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean Michael Hogan. Lazarus by Leonid Andreev, translated by Abraham Yarmolinsky. Part One. When Lazarus left the grave, where, for three days and three nights, he had been under the enigmatical sway of death, and returned alive to his dwelling, for a long time no one noticed in him those sinister oddities which, as time went on, made his very name a terror. Gladdened unspeakably by the sight of him who had been returned to life, those near to him caressed him unceasingly, and satiated their burning desire to serve him in solicitude for his food and drink and garments and they dressed him gorgeously in bright colors of hope and laughter and when like a bridegroom in his bridal vestures he sat again among them at the table and again ate and drank they wept overwhelmed with tenderness and they summoned the neighbors to look at him who had risen miraculously from the dead these came and shared the serene joy of the hosts strangers from far-off towns and hamlets came and adored the miracle in tempestuous words like to a beehive was the house of Mary and Martha. Whatever was found new in Lazarus's face and gestures was thought to be some trace of a grave illness and of the shocks recently experienced. Evidently the destruction wrought by death on the corpse was only arrested by the miraculous power, but its effects were still apparent, and what death had succeeded in doing with Lazarus's face and body was like an artist's unfinished sketch seen under thin glass. On Lazarus's temples, under his eyes, and in the hollows of his cheeks, lay a deep and cadaverous blueness. Cadaverously blue also were his long fingers, and around his fingernails, grown long in the grave, the blue had become purple and dark. On his lips the skin, swollen in the grave, had burst in places, and thin reddish cracks were formed, shining as though covered with transparent mica. And he had grown stout. His body, puffed up in the grave, retained its monstrous size and showed those frightful swellings in which one sensed the presence of the rank liquid of decomposition. But the heavy corpse-like odor which penetrated Lazarus's grave clothes, and it seemed his very body, soon entirely disappeared, the blue spots on his face and hands grew paler, and the reddish cracks closed up, although they never disappeared altogether. 
That is how Lazarus looked when he appeared before people in his second life, but his face looked natural to those who had seen him in the coffin. In addition to the changes in his appearance, Lazarus's temper seemed to have undergone a transformation, but this circumstance startled no one and attracted no attention. Before his death, Lazarus had always been cheerful and carefree, fond of laughter and a merry joke. It was because of this brightness and cheerfulness, with not a touch of malice and darkness, that the master had grown so fond of him. But now Lazarus had grown grave and taciturn. He never jested himself, nor responded with laughter to other people's jokes, and the words which he uttered very infrequently were the plainest, most ordinary and necessary words, as deprived of depth and significance, as those sounds with which animals express pain and pleasure, thirst and hunger. They were the words that one can say all one's life, and yet they give no indication of what pains and gladdens the depths of the soul. Thus, with the face of a corpse which for three days had been under the heavy sway of death, dark and taciturn, already appallingly transformed, but still unrecognized by anyone in his new self, he was sitting at the feasting table among friends and relatives, and his gorgeous nuptial garments glittered with yellow gold and bloody scarlet. Broad waves of jubilation, now soft, now tempestuously sonorous, surged around him. Warm glances of love were reaching out for his face, still cold with the coldness of the grave, and a friend's warm palm caressed his blue, heavy hand, and music played the tympanum and the pipe, the chitara and the harp, it was as though bees hummed, grasshoppers chirped, and birds warbled over the happy house of Mary and Martha. Part Two One of the guests incautiously lifted the veil. By a thoughtless word he broke the serene charm and uncovered the truth in all its naked ugliness. Ere the thought formed itself in his mind, his lips uttered with a smile, Why dost thou not tell us what happened yonder? and all grew silent, startled by the question. It was as if it occurred to them only now that for three days Lazarus had been dead, and they looked at him, anxiously awaiting his answer. But Lazarus kept silence. "'Thou dost not wish to tell us?' wondered the man. "'Is it so terrible yonder?' And again his thought came after his words. Had it been otherwise, he would not have asked this question, which at that very moment oppressed his heart with its insufferable horror. Uneasiness seized all present, and with a feeling of heavy weariness they awaited Lazarus's words. But he was silent, sternly and coldly, and his eyes were lowered. And as if for the first time they noticed the frightful blueness of his face and his repulsive obesity, on the table as though forgotten by Lazarus, rested his bluish-purple wrist, and to this all eyes turned, as if it were from it that the awaited answer was to come. The musicians were still playing, but now the silence reached them too, and even as water extinguishes scattered embers, so were their merry tunes extinguished in the silence. The pipe grew silent, the voices of the sonorous tympanum and the murmuring harp died away and as if the strings had burst, the chitara answered with a tremulous, broken note. Silence. Thou dost not wish to say, repeated the guest, unable to check his chattering tongue. But the stillness remained unbroken, and the bluish-purple hand rested motionless. And then he stirred slightly, and everyone felt relieved. He lifted up his eyes, and lo! straightway embracing everything in one heavy glance, fraught with weariness and horror, he looked at them, Lazarus, who had arisen from the dead. It was the third day since Lazarus had left the grave. Ever since then many had experienced the pernicious power of his eye, but neither those who were crushed by it forever, nor those who found the strength to resist in it the primordial sources of life, which is as mysterious as death, Never could they explain the horror which lay motionless in the depth of his black pupils. Lazarus looked calmly and simply, with no desire to conceal anything, but also with no intention to say anything. He looked coldly, as he who is infinitely indifferent to those alive. Many carefree people came close to him without noticing him, and only later did they learn with astonishment and fear who that calm, stout man was, 
that walked slowly by, almost touching them with his gorgeous and dazzling garments. The sun did not cease shining when he was looking, nor did the fountain hush its murmur, and the sky overhead remained cloudless and blue. But the man under the spell of his enigmatical look heard no more the fountain and saw not the sky overhead. Sometimes he wept bitterly, sometimes he tore his hair and in frenzy called for help. But more often it came to pass that apathetically and quietly he began to die, and so he languished many years before everybody's very eyes wasted away, colorless, flabby, dull, like a tree, silently drying up in a stony soil. And of those who gazed at him, the ones who wept madly sometimes felt again the stir of life, the others never. So thou dost not wish to tell us what thou hast seen yonder, repeated the man, but now his voice was impassive and dull, and deadly gray weariness showed in Lazarus's eyes and deadly gray weariness covered like dust all the faces, and with dull amazement the guests stared at each other, and did not understand wherefore they had gathered here and sat at the rich table. The talk ceased. They thought it was time to go home, but could not overcome the flaccid, lazy weariness which glued their muscles, and they kept on sitting there, yet apart and torn away from each other, like pale fires scattered over a dark field but the musicians were paid to play, and again they took their instruments, and again tunes full of studied mirth and studied sorrow began to flow and to rise. They unfolded the customary melody, but the guests hearkened in dull amazement. Already they knew not wherefore is it necessary, and why is it well that people should pluck strings, inflate their cheeks, blow in thin pipes, and produce a bizarre many-voiced noise. What bad music, said someone. The musicians took offense and left. Following them, the guests left one after another, for night was already come. And when placid darkness encircled them, and they began to breathe with more ease, suddenly Lazarus's image loomed up before each one in formidable radiance. The blue face of a corpse, grave clothes gorgeous and resplendent, a cold look in the depths of which lay motionless and unknown horror. As though petrified, they were standing far apart, and darkness enveloped them. But in the darkness blazed brighter and brighter the supernatural vision of him who for three days had been under the enigmatical sway of death. For three days had he been dead. Thrice had the sun risen and set, but he had been dead. Children had played, Streams murmured over pebbles, the wayfarer had lifted up hot dust in the high road, but he had been dead, and now he is again among them, touches them, looks at them, looks at them, and through the black discs of his pupils, as through darkened glass, stares the unknowable yonder. Part 3 No one was taking care of Lazarus, for no friends nor relatives were left to him and the great desert which encircled the holy city came near the very threshold of his dwelling. And the desert entered his house, and stretched on his couch like a wife, and extinguished the fires. No one was taking care of Lazarus. One after the other his sisters, Mary and Martha, forsook him. For a long while Martha was loath to abandon him, for she knew not who would feed him and pity him. She wept and prayed. But one night, when the wind was roaming in the desert, and with a hissing sound the cypresses were bending over the roof, she dressed noiselessly and secretly left the house. Lazarus probably heard the door slam. It banged against the side post under the gusts of the desert wind. But he did not rise to go out and to look at her that was abandoning him. All the night long the cypresses hissed over his head and plaintively thumped the door letting in the cold, greedy desert. Like a leper, he was shunned by everyone, and it was proposed to tie a bell to his neck, as is done with lepers, to warn people against sudden meetings. But someone remarked, growing frightfully pale, that it would be too horrible if by night the moaning of Lazarus's bell were suddenly heard under the windows, 
and so the project was abandoned. And since he did not take care of himself, he would probably have starved to death, had not the neighbors brought him food in fear of something that they sensed but vaguely. The food was brought to him by children. They were not afraid of Lazarus, nor did they mock him with naive cruelty as children are wont to do with the wretched and miserable. They were indifferent to him, and Lazarus answered them with the same coldness. He had no desire to caress the black little curls and to look into their innocent shining eyes. Given to time and to the desert, his house was crumbling down, and long since had his famishing, lowing goats wandered away to the neighboring pastures. And his bridal garments became threadbare. Ever since that happy day when the musicians played, he had worn them unaware of the difference of the new and the worn. The bright colors grew dull and faded. Vicious dogs and the sharp thorn of the desert turned the tender fabric into rags. By day, when the merciless sun slew all things alive, and even scorpions sought shelter under stones and writhed there in a mad desire to sting, he sat motionless under the sun rays, his blue face and the uncouth bushy beard lifted up, bathing in the fiery flood. When people still talked to him, he was once asked, Poor Lazarus, does it please thee to sit thus and to stare at the sun? And he had answered, Yes, it does. So strong, it seemed, was the cold of his three days' grave, so deep the darkness, that there was no heat on earth to warm Lazarus, nor a splendor that could brighten the darkness of his eyes. That is what came to the mind of those who spoke to Lazarus, and with a sigh they left him. And when the scarlet, flattened globe would lower, Lazarus would set out for the desert and walk straight toward the sun, as though striving to reach it. He always walked straight toward the sun, and those who tried to follow him and to spy upon what he was doing at night in the desert retained in their memory the black silhouette of a tall, stout man against the red background of an enormous, flattened disk. Night pursued them with her horrors, and so they did not learn of Lazarus's doings in the desert, but the vision of the black on red was forever branded on their brain. Just as a beast with a splinter in its eye furiously rubs its muzzle with its paws, so they too foolishly rubbed their eyes. But what Lazarus had given was indelible, and death alone could efface it. But there were people who lived far away, who never saw Lazarus, and knew of him only by report. With daring curiosity which is stronger than fear and feeds upon it, with hidden mockery, they would come to Lazarus, who was sitting in the sun, and enter into conversation with him. By this time Lazarus' appearance had changed for the better, and was not so terrible. The first minute they snapped their fingers and thought of how stupid the inhabitants of the holy city were. But when the short talk was over and they started homeward, their looks were such that the inhabitants of the holy city recognized them at once, and said, Look, there is one more fool on whom Lazarus has set his eye and they shook their heads regretfully and lifted up their arms. There came brave, intrepid warriors with tinkling weapons. Happy youths came with laughter and song. Busy tradesmen, jingling their money, ran in for a moment, and haughty priests leaned their croziers against Lazarus's door, and they were all strangely changed as they came back. The same terrible shadow swooped down upon their souls, and give a new appearance to the old, familiar world. Those who still had the desire to speak expressed their feelings thus. All things tangible and visible grew hollow, light, and transparent, similar to lights and shadows in the darkness of night. For that great darkness, which holds the whole cosmos, was dispersed neither by the sun or by the moon and the stars, but like an immense black shroud enveloped the earth and like a mother embraced it. It penetrated all the bodies, iron and stone, and the particles of the bodies, having lost their ties, grew lonely, and it penetrated into the depths of the particles, and the particles of particles became lonely. For that great void which encircles the cosmos was not filled by things visible, neither by the sun nor by the moon and the stars, but reigned unrestrained, penetrating everywhere, severing body from body, 
particle from particle. In the void hollow trees spread hollow roots threatening a fantastic fall. Temples, palaces, and horses loomed up, and they were hollow, and in the void men moved about restlessly, but they were light and hollow like shadows. For time was no more, and the beginning of all things came near their end. The building was still being built, and builders were still hammering away, and its ruins were already seen and the void in its place. The man was still being born, but already funeral candles were burning at his head, and now they were extinguished, and there was the void in place of the man and of the funeral candles. And wrapped by void and darkness, the man in despair trembled in the face of the horror of the infinite. Thus spake the men who had still a desire to speak, but surely much more could have told those who wished not to speak and died in silence. Part 4 At that time there lived in Rome a renowned sculptor. In clay, marble, and bronze he wrought bodies of gods and men, and such was their beauty that people called them immortal. But he himself was discontented, and asserted that there was something even more beautiful that he could not embody either in marble or in bronze. I have not yet gathered the glimmers of the moon, nor have I my fill of sunshine, he was wont to say, and there is no soul in my marble, no life in my beautiful bronze. And when on moonlight nights he slowly walked along the road, crossing the black shadows of cypresses, his white tunic glittering in the moonshine, those who met him would laugh in a friendly way and say, Art thou going to gather moonshine, Aurelius? Why then didst thou not fetch baskets? And he would answer, laughing and pointing to his eyes, here are the baskets wherein I gather the sheen of the moon and the glimmer of the sun. And so it was. The moon glimmered in his eyes, and the sun sparkled therein. But he could not translate them into marble, and therein lay the serene tragedy of his life. He was descended from an ancient patrician race, had a good wife and children, and suffered from no want. When the obscure rumor about Lazarus reached him, he consulted his wife and friends, and undertook the far journey to Judea to see him who had miraculously risen from the dead. He was somewhat weary in those days, and he hoped that the road would sharpen his blunted senses. What was said of Lazarus did not frighten him. He had pondered much over death, did not like it, but he disliked also those who confused it with life. In this life, life and beauty, beyond death the enigmatical, thought he, and there is no better thing for a man to do than to delight in life and in the beauty of all things living. He had even a vainglorious desire to convince Lazarus of the truth of his own view and restore his soul to life, as his body had been restored. This seemed so much easier because the rumors, shy and strange, did not render the whole truth about Lazarus, and but vaguely warned against something frightful. Lazarus had just risen from the stone in order to follow the sun which was setting in the desert, when a rich Roman attended by an armed slave approached him and addressed him in a sonorous tone of voice. Lazarus! And Lazarus beheld a superb face, lit with glory and arrayed in fine clothes and precious stones sparkling in the sun. The red light lent to the Roman's face and head the appearance of gleaming bronze. That also Lazarus noticed. He resumed obediently his place and lowered his weary eyes. Yes, thou art ugly, my poor Lazarus, quietly said the Roman, playing with his golden chain. Thou art even horrible, my poor friend. And death was not lazy that day when thou didst fall so heedlessly into his hands. But thou art stout, and as the great Caesar used to say, fat people are not ill-tempered. To tell the truth, I don't understand why men fear thee. Permit me to spend the night in thy house. The hour is late, and I have no shelter. Never had any one asked Lazarus' hospitality. I have no bed, said he. I am somewhat of a soldier, and I can sleep sitting, the Roman answered. We shall build a fire. I have no fire. Then we shall have our talk in the darkness, like two friends. I think thou wilt find a bottle of wine. I have no wine. The Roman laughed. Now I see why thou art so sombre and dislikest thy second life. No wine! Why, then we shall do without it. There are words that make the head go around better than the Falernian. 
By a sign he dismissed the slave, and they remained all alone. And again the sculptor started speaking, but it was as if, together with the setting sun, life had left his words, and they grew pale and hollow, as if they staggered on unsteady feet, as if they slipped and fell down, drunk with the heavy lees of weariness and despair, and black chasms grew up between the words, like far-off hints of the great void and the great darkness. "'Now I am thy guest, and thou wilt not be unkind to me, Lazarus,' said he. "'Hospitality is the duty even of those who for three days were dead. Three days, I was told, thou didst rest in the grave. There it must be cold. And that is whence comes thy ill habit of going without fire and wine. As to me, I like fire. It grows dark here so rapidly. The lines of thy eyebrows and forehead are quite, quite interesting. They're like ruins of strange palaces buried in ashes after an earthquake. But why dost thou wear such ugly and queer garments? I've seen bridegrooms in thy country, and they wear such clothes. Are they not funny and terrible? But art thou a bridegroom? The sun had already disappeared. A monstrous black shadow came running from the east. It was as if gigantic bare feet began rumbling on the sand, and the wind sent a cold wave along the backbone. In the darkness thou seemest still larger, Lazarus, as if thou hast grown stouter in these moments. Dost thou feed on darkness, Lazarus? I would fain have a little fire, at least a little fire, a little fire. I feel somewhat chilly, your nights are so barbarously cold. Were it not so dark, I should say that thou wert looking at me, Lazarus. Yes, it seems to me, thou art looking. Why, thou art looking at me, I feel it. But there thou art smiling. Night came and filled the air with heavy blackness. How well it will be when the sun will rise tomorrow in you. I am a great sculptor, thou knowest. That is how my friends call me. I create. Yes, that is the word. But I need daylight. I give life to the cold marble. I melt sonorous bronze in fire, in bright hot fire. Why didst thou touch me with thy hand? Come, said Lazarus. Thou art my guest. And they went to the house, and the long night enveloped the earth. The slave, seeing that his master did not come, went to seek him, when the sun was already high in the sky. And he beheld his master side by side with Lazarus, in profound silence were they sitting right under the dazzling and scorching sun rays and looking upward. The slave began to weep and cried out, My master, what has befallen thee, master? The very same day the sculptor left for Rome. On the way Aurelius was pensive and taciturn, staring attentively at everything, the men, the ship, the sea, as though trying to retain something. On the high sea a storm burst upon them, and all through it Aurelius stayed on the deck and eagerly scanned the seas looming near and sinking with a thud. At home his friends were frightened at the change which had taken place in Aurelius, but he calmed them, saying meaningly, I have found it. And without changing the dusty clothes he wore on his journey, he fell to work, and the marble obediently resounded under his sonorous hammer. Long and eagerly worked he, admitting no one, until one morning he announced that the work was ready and ordered his friends to be summoned, severe critics and connoisseurs of art. And to meet them he put on bright and gorgeous garments that glittered with yellow gold and scarlet byssus. Here is my work, said he thoughtfully. His friends glanced, and a shadow of profound sorrow covered their faces. It was something monstrous deprived of all the lines and shapes familiar to the eye, but not without a hint at some new, strange image. On a thin, crooked twig, or rather on an ugly likeness of a twig, rested askew a blind, ugly, shapeless, outspread mass of something utterly and inconceivably distorted, a mad leap of wild and bizarre fragments, all feebly and vainly striving to part from one another, and as if by chance, beneath one of the wildly rent salients, a butterfly was chiseled with divine skill, all airy loveliness, delicacy, and beauty, with transparent wings which seemed to tremble with an impotent desire to take flight. 
Wherefore this wonderful butterfly, Aurelius? said someone falteringly. I know not, was the sculptor's answer. But it was necessary to tell the truth, and one of his friends who loved him best said firmly, This is ugly, my poor friend. It must be destroyed. Give me the hammer. And with two strokes he broke the monstrous man into pieces, leaving only the infinitely delicate butterfly untouched. From that time on Aurelius created nothing. With profound indifference he looked at marble and bronze, and on his former divine works, where everlasting beauty rested. With the purpose of arousing his former fervent passion for work, and awakening his deadened soul, his friends took him to see other artists' beautiful works, but he remained indifferent as before, and the smile did not warm up his tightened lips and only after listening to lengthy talks about beauty, he would retort wearily and indolently, But all this is a lie. And by the day, when the sun was shining, he went into his magnificent, skillfully built garden, and having found a place without shadow, he exposed his bare head to the glare and heat. Red and white butterflies floated around. From the crooked lips of a drunken satyr, water streamed down with a splash into a marble cistern, but he sat motionless and silent, like a pallid reflection of him who, in the far-off distance, at the very gates of the stony desert, sat under the fiery sun. Part Five. And now it came to pass that the great deified Augustus himself summoned Lazarus. The imperial messengers dressed him gorgeously in solemn nuptial clothes, as if time had legalized them, and he was to remain until his very death the bridegroom of an unknown bride. It was as though an old rotting coffin had been gilt and furnished with new gay tassels, and men, all in trim and bright attire, rode after him, as if in bridal procession indeed, and those foremost trumpeted loudly, bidding people to clear the way for the emperor's messengers. But Lazarus's way was deserted. His native land cursed the hateful name of him who had miraculously risen from the dead, and people scattered at the very news of his appalling approach. The solitary voice of the brass trumpet sounded in the motionless air, and the wilderness alone responded with its languid echo. Then Lazarus went by sea, and his was the most magnificently arrayed and the most mournful ship that ever mirrored itself in the azure waves of the Mediterranean Sea. Many were the travelers aboard, but like a tomb was the ship, all silence and stillness, and the despairing water sobbed at the steep, proudly curved prow. All alone sat Lazarus, exposing his head to the blaze of the sun, silently listening to the murmur and splash of the wavelets, and afar seamen and messengers were sitting, a vague group of weary shadows. Had the thunder burst and the wind attacked the red sails, the ships would probably have perished, for none of those aboard had either the will or the strength to struggle for life. With a supreme effort, some mariners would reach the board and eagerly scan the blue, transparent sea, hoping to see a naiad's pink shoulder flash in the hollow of an azure wave, or a drunken gay centaur dash along and in frenzy splash the wave with his hoof but the sea was like a wilderness, and the deep was dumb and deserted. With utter indifference did Lazarus set his feet on the street of the Eternal City, as though all her wealth, all the magnificence of her palaces built by giants, all the resplendence, beauty, and music of her refined life were but the echo of the wind in the wilderness, the reflection of the desert quicksand. Chariots were dashing, and along the streets were moving crowds of strong, fair, proud builders of the eternal city and haughty participants in her life. A song sounded. Fountains and women laughed a pearly laughter. Drunken philosophers harangued, and the sober listened to them with a smile. Hoofs struck the stone pavements. And surrounded by cheerful noise, a stout, heavy man was moving. A cold spot of silence and despair. And on his way he sowed disgust, anger and vague, gnawing weariness. Who dares to be sad in Rome, wondered indignantly the citizens, and frowned. In two days the entire city already knew all about him who had miraculously risen from the dead, 
and shunned him shyly. But some daring people there were who wanted to test their strength, and Lazarus obeyed their imprudent summons. Kept busy by state affairs, the emperor constantly delayed the reception, and seven days did he who had risen from the dead go about visiting others. And Lazarus came to a cheerful Epicurean, and the host met him with laughter on his lips. Drink, Lazarus, drink, shouted he. Would not Augustus laugh to see thee drunk? And half-naked drunken women laughed, and rose petals fell on Lazarus's blue hands. But then the Epicurean looked into Lazarus's eyes, and his gaiety ended forever. Drunkard remained he for the rest of his life. Never did he drink, yet forever was he drunk. But instead of the gay reverie which wine brings with it, frightful dreams began to haunt him, the sole food of his stricken spirit. Day and night he lived in the poisonous vapors of his nightmares, and death itself was not more frightful than her raving monstrous forerunners. And Lazarus came to a youth and his beloved, who loved each other and were most beautiful in their passions. Proudly and strongly embracing his love, the youth said with serene regret, Look at us, Lazarus, and share our joy. Is there anything stronger than love? And Lazarus looked, and for the rest of their life they kept on loving each other, but their passion grew gloomy and joyless, like those funeral cypresses whose roots feed on the decay of the graves, and whose black summits in a still evening hour seek in vain to reach the sky. Thrown by the unknown forces of life into each other's embraces, they mingled tears with kisses, voluptuous pleasures with pain, and they felt themselves doubly slaves, obedient slaves to life and patient servants of the silent nothingness. Ever united, ever severed, they blazed like sparks and like sparks lost themselves in the boundless dark. And Lazarus came to a haughty sage, and the sage said to him, I know all the horrors thou canst reveal to me. Is there anything thou canst frighten me with? But before long the sage felt that the knowledge of horror was far from being the horror itself, and that the vision of death was not death, and he felt that wisdom and folly are equal before the face of infinity, for infinity knows them not. And it vanished, the dividing line between knowledge and ignorance, truth and falsehood, top and bottom, and the shapeless thought hung suspended in the void. Then the sage clutched his gray head and cried out frantically, I cannot think, I cannot think. Thus under the indifferent glance for him who miraculously had risen from the dead perished everything that asserts life, its significance and joys. And it was suggested that it was dangerous to let him see the emperor, that it was better to kill him, and having buried him secretly, to tell the emperor that he had disappeared, no one knew whither. Already swords were being wetted, and youths devoted to the public welfare prepared for the murder. When Augustus ordered Lazarus to be brought before him next morning, thus destroying their cruel plans. If there was no way of getting rid of Lazarus, at least it was possible to soften the terrible impression his face produced. With this in view, skillful painters, barbers, and artists were summoned, and all night long they were busy over Lazarus's head. They cropped his beard, curled it, and gave it a tidy, agreeable appearance. By means of paints they concealed the corpse-like blueness of his hands and face. Repulsive were the wrinkles of suffering that furrowed his old face, and they were puttied, painted, and smoothed. Then, over the smooth background, wrinkles of good-tempered laughter and pleasant, carefree mirth were skillfully painted with fine brushes. Lazarus submitted indifferently to everything that was done to him. Soon he was turned into a becomingly stout, venerable old man, into a quiet and kind grandfather of numerous offspring. It seemed that the smile with which only a while ago he was spinning funny yarns was still lingering on his lips, and that in the corner of his eyes serene tenderness was hiding, the companion of old age. But people did not dare change his nuptial garments, and they could not change his eyes two dark and frightful glasses through which looked at men the unknowable yonder. Part 6 Lazarus was not moved by the magnificence of the imperial palace, 
It was as though he saw no difference between the crumbling house, closely pressed by the desert, and the stone palace, solid and fair, and indifferently he passed into it. And the hard marble of the floors under his feet grew similar to the quicksand of the desert, and the multitude of richly dressed and haughty men became like void air under his glance. No one looked into his face as Lazarus passed by, fearing to fall under the appalling influence of his eyes. But when the sound of his heavy footsteps had sufficiently died down, the courtiers raised their heads and with fearful curiosity examined the figure of a stout, tall, slightly bent old man, who was slowly penetrating into the very heart of the imperial palace. Were death itself passing, it would be faced with no greater fear, for until then the dead alone knew death, and those alive knew life only, and there was no bridge between them. But this extraordinary man, although alive, knew death, and enigmatical, appalling was his cursed knowledge. Woe, people thought, he will take the life of our great deified Augustus. And they sent curses after Lazarus, who meanwhile kept on advancing into the interior of the palace. Already did the emperor know who Lazarus was, and prepared to meet him. But the monarch was a brave man, and felt his own tremendous, unconquerable power, and in his fatal duel with him who had miraculously risen from the dead, he wanted not to invoke human help. And so he met Lazarus face to face. Lift not thine eyes upon me, Lazarus, he ordered. I heard thy face is like that of Medusa, and turns into stone whomsoever thou lookest at. Now I wish to see thee, and to have a talk with thee, before I turn into stone, added he in a tone of kingly jesting, not devoid of fear. Coming close to him, he carefully examined Lazarus's face and his strange festal garments, and although he had a keen eye, he was deceived by his appearance. So, thou dost not appear terrible, my venerable old man, but the worse for us, if horror assumes such a respectable and pleasant air. Now let us have a talk. Augustus sat, and questioning Lazarus with his eye as much as with words, started the conversation. Why didst thou not greet me as thou enteredst? Lazarus answered indifferent. I knew not it was necessary. Art thou a Christian? No. Augustus approvingly shook his head. That is good. I do not like Christians. They shake the tree of life before it is covered with fruit, and disperse its odorous bloom to the winds. But who art thou? With a visible effort, Lazarus answered, I was dead. I had heard that, but who art thou now? Lazarus was silent, but at last repeated in a tone of weary apathy, I was dead. Listen to me, stranger, said the emperor, distinctly and severely giving utterance to the thought that had come to him at the beginning. My realm is the realm of life. My people are of the living, not of the dead. Thou art here one too many. I know not who thou art and what thou sawest there, but if thou liest, I hate thy lies, and if thou tellest the truth, I hate thy truth. In my bosom I feel the throb of life, I feel strength in my arm, and my proud thoughts like eagles pierce the space. And yonder in the shelter of my rule, under the protection of laws created by me, people live and toil and rejoice. Dost thou hear the battle cry, the challenge men throw into the face of the future? Augustus, as in prayer, stretched forth his arms and exclaimed solemnly, Be blessed, O great and divine life! Lazarus was silent, and with growing sternness the emperor went on. Thou art not wanted here, miserable remnant, snatched from under death's teeth. Thou inspirest weariness and disgust with life. Like a caterpillar in the fields, thou gloatest on the rich ear of joy, and belchest out the drivel of despair and sorrow. Thy truth is like a rusty sword in the hands of a knightly murderer, and as a murderer thou shalt be executed. But before that, let me look into thine eyes. Perchance only cowards are afraid of them, but in the brave they awaken the thirst for strife and victory. Then thou shalt be rewarded, not executed. Now look at me, Lazarus. At first it appeared to the deified Augustus that a friend was looking at him. So soft, so tenderly fascinating was Lazarus's glance. 
It promised not horror, but sweet rest, and the infinite seemed to him a tender mistress, a compassionate sister, a mother. But stronger and stronger grew its embraces, and already the mouth, greedy of hissing kisses, interfered with the monarch's breathing, and already to the surface of the soft tissues of the body came the iron of the bones, and tightened its merciless circle, and unknown fangs, blunt and cold, touched his heart and sank into it with slow indolence. "'It pains,' said the deified Augustus, growing pale. "'But look at me, Lazarus, look!' It was as though some heavy gates, ever closed, were slowly moving apart, and through the glowing interstice the appalling horror of the infinite poured in slowly and steadily. Like two shadows there entered the shoreless void and the unfathomable darkness. They extinguished the sun, ravished the earth from under the feet, and the roof from over the head. No more did the frozen heart ache. Look, look, Lazarus, ordered Augustus, tottering. Time stood still, and the beginning of each thing grew frightfully near to its end. Augustus's throne just erected, crumbled down, and the void was already in the place of the throne and of Augustus. Noiselessly did Rome crumble down, and a new city stood on its site, and it too was swallowed by the void. Like fantastic giants, cities, states, and countries fell down and vanished in the void darkness, and with uttermost indifference to the insatiable black womb of the infinite swallow them. Halt! ordered the emperor. In his voice sounded already a note of indifference. His hands dropped in languor, and in the vain struggle with the onrushing darkness, his fiery eyes now blazed up and now went out. My life thou hast taken from me, Lazarus, said he in a spiritless, feeble voice. And these words of hopelessness saved him. He remembered his people, whose shield he was destined to be, and keen salutary pain pierced his deadened heart. They are doomed to death, he thought wearily. Serene shadows in the darkness of the infinite, thought he and horror grew upon him. Frail vessels with living, seething blood, with a heart that knows sorrow, and also great joy, said he in his heart, and tenderness pervaded it. Thus pondering and oscillating between the poles of life and death, he slowly came back to life, to find in its suffering and in its joys a shield against the darkness of the void and the horror of the infinite. No, thou hast not murdered me, Lazarus, said he firmly. But I will take thy life. Be gone. That evening the deified Augustus partook of his meats and drinks with particular joy. Now and then his lifted hand remained suspended in the air, and a dull glimmer replaced the bright sheen of his fiery eye. It was the cold wave of horror that surged at his feet. Defeated but not undone, Ever awaiting its hour, that horror stood at the emperor's bedside, like a black shadow all through his life. It swayed his nights, but yielded the days to the sorrows and joys of life. The following day, the hangman with a hot iron burned out Lazarus's eyes. Then he was sent home. The deified Augustus dared not kill him. Lazarus returned to the desert and the wilderness met him with hissing gusts of wind and the heat of the blazing sun. Again he was sitting on a stone, his rough, bushy beard lifted up, and the two black holes in place of his eyes looked at the sky with an expression of dull terror. Afar off the holy city stirred noisily and restlessly, but around him everything was deserted and dumb. No one approached the place where lived he who had miraculously risen from the dead, and long since his neighbors had forsaken their houses. Driven by the hot iron into the depth of his skull, his cursed knowledge hid there in an ambush. As though leaping out from an ambush, it plunged its thousand invisible eyes into the man, and no one dared look at Lazarus. 
and in the evening, when the sun, reddening and growing wider, would come nearer and nearer the western horizon, the blind Lazarus would slowly follow it. He would stumble against stones and fall, stout and weak as he was, would rise heavily to his feet and walk on again, and on the red screen of the sunset his black body and outspread hands would form a monstrous likeness of a cross. And it came to pass that once he went out and did not come back. Thus seemingly ended the second life of him who for three days had been under the enigmatical sway of death and rose miraculously from the dead. End of Lazarus Recording by Sean Michael Hogan, St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada Nyarlathotep by H. P. Lovecraft This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Piazza Nyarlathotep by H. P. Lovecraft Nyarlathotep, crawling chaos, I am the last. I will tell the audience, void. I do not recall distinctly when it began, but it was months ago. The general tension was horrible. To a season of political and social upheaval was added a strange and brooding apprehension of hideous physical danger, a danger widespread and all-embracing, such a danger as may be imagined only in the most terrible phantasms of the night. I recall that the people went about with pale and worried faces, and whispered warnings and prophecies which no one dared consciously repeat or acknowledge to himself that he had heard. A sense of monstrous guilt was upon the land, and out of the abysses between the stars swept chill currents that made men shiver in dark and lonely places. There was a demoniac alteration in the sequence of the seasons. The autumn heat lingered fearsomely, and everyone felt that the world, and perhaps the universe, had passed from the control of known gods or forces to that of gods or forces which were unknown. And it was then that Nyarlathotep came out of Egypt, who he was none could tell, but he was of the old native blood and looked like a pharaoh. The fellahin knelt when they saw him, yet could not say why. He said he had risen up out of the blackness of twenty-seven centuries, and that he had heard messages from places not on this planet. Into the lands of civilization came Nyarlathotep, swarthy, slender, and sinister always buying strange instruments of glass and metal, and combining them into instruments yet stranger. He spoke much of the sciences, of electricity and psychology, and gave exhibitions of power, which sent his spectators away speechless, yet which swelled his fame to exceeding magnitude. Men advised one another to see Nyarlathotep, and shuddered. And where Nyarlathotep went, rest vanished, for the small hours were rent with the screams of nightmare. Never before had the screams of nightmare been such a public problem. Now the wise men almost wished they could forbid sleep in the small hours, that the shrieks of cities might less horribly disturb the pale, pitying moon as it glimmered on green waters, gliding under bridges and old steeples crumbling against a sickly sky. I remember when Nyarlathotep came to my city, the great, the old, the terrible city of unnumbered crimes. My friend had told me of him and of the impelling fascination and allurement of his revelations, and I burned with eagerness to explore his uttermost mysteries. My friend said they were horrible and impressive beyond my most fevered imaginings, 
And what was thrown on the screen in a darkened room prophesied things none but Nalapotep dared prophesy. And in the sputter of his sparks there was taken from men that which had never been taken before, yet which should only in the eyes. And I heard it hinted abroad that those who knew Nyarlathotep looked on sights which others saw not. It was in the hot autumn that I went through the night with the restless crowds to see Nyarlathotep, through the stifling night and up the endless stairs into the choking room, and shadowed on a screen I saw hooded forms amidst ruins, and yellow evil faces peering from behind fallen monuments, and I saw the world battling against blackness, against the waves of destruction from ultimate space, whirling, churning, struggling around the dimming, cooling sun. Then the sparks played amazingly around the heads of the spectators, and hair stood up on end, while shadows more grotesque than I can tell came out and squatted on the heads, and when I, who was colder and more scientific than the rest, mumbled a trembling protest about imposture and static electricity, Nyarlathotep drove us all out down the dizzy stairs into the damp, hot, deserted midnight streets. I screamed aloud that I was not afraid, that I never could be afraid, and others screamed with me for solace. We swore to one another that the city was exactly the same and still alive, and when the electric lights began to fade, we cursed the company over and over again, and laughed at the queer faces we made. I believe we felt something coming down from the greenish moon, for when we began to depend on its light, we drifted into curious, involuntary marching formations, and seemed to know our destinations, though we dared not think of them. Once we looked at the pavement, and found the blocks loose and displaced by grass, with scarce a line of rusted metal to shoe where the tramways had run. And again we saw a tramcar, lone, windowless, dilapidated, and almost on its side. When we gazed around the horizon, we could not find the third tower by the river, and noticed that the silhouette of the second tower was ragged at the top. We then split up into narrow columns, each of which seemed drawn in a different direction. One disappeared in a narrow alley to the left, leaving only the echo of a shocking moan. Another file down a weed-choked subway entrance, howling with a laughter that was mad. My own column was sucked toward the open country, and presently I felt a chill which was not of the hot autumn. For as we stalked out on the dark moor, we beheld around us the hellish moon-glitter of evil snows. Trackless, inexplicable snows swept asunder in one direction only where lay a gulf all the blacker for its glittering walls. The column seemed very thin indeed as it plodded dreamily into the gulf. I lingered behind, for the black rift in the green-litten snow was frightful, and I thought I had heard the reverberations of a disquieting wail as my companions vanished. But my power to linger was slight. As if beckoned by those who had gone before, I half floated between the titanic snowdrifts, quivering and afraid into the sightless vortex of the unimaginable. Screamingly sentient, dumbly delirious, only the gods that were can tell. A sickened, sensitive shadow writhing in hands that are not hands, and whirled blindly past ghastly midnights of rotting creation. Corpses of dead worlds with sores that were cities, charnel winds that brushed the pallid stars and made them flicker low. Beyond the worlds, vague ghosts of monstrous things, half-seen columns of unsanctified temples that rest on nameless rocks beneath space and reach up to dizzy vacua above the spheres of light and darkness. And through this revolting 
graveyard of the universe, the muffled, maddening beating of drums, and thin, monotonous whine of blasphemous flutes from inconceivable, unlighted chambers beyond time, the detestable pounding and piping whereon to dance slowly, awkwardly, and absurdly the gigantic tenebrous ultimate gods, the blind, voiceless, mindless gargoyles whose soul is Nyarlathotep. End of Nyarlathotep. The Open Window by Saki. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel, New Jersey, Summer 2009. The Open Window by Saki. My aunt will be down presently, Mr. Nuttall, said a very self-possessed young lady of fifteen. In the meantime, you must try and put up with me. Brampton Nuttall endeavoured to say the correct something which should duly flatter the niece of the moment, without unduly discounting the aunt that was to come. Privately, he doubted more than ever whether these formal visits on a succession of total strangers would do much towards helping the nerve cure which he was supposed to be undergoing. I know how it will be, his sister had said, when he was preparing to migrate to this rural retreat. You will bury yourself down there and not speak to a living soul, and your nerves will be worse than ever from moping. I shall just give you letters of introduction to all the people I know there. Some of them, as far as I can remember, were quite nice. Frampton wondered whether Mrs. Sappleton, the lady to whom he was presenting one of the letters of introduction, came into the nice division. Do you know many of the people round here? asked the niece, when she judged that they had had sufficient silent communion. Hardly a soul, said Frampton. My sister was saying here, at the rectory, you know, some four years ago, and she gave me letters of introduction to some of the people here. He made the last statement in a tone of distinct regret. Then you know practically nothing about my aunt? pursued the self-possessed young lady. Only her name and address, admitted the caller. He was wondering whether Mrs. Sappleton was in the married or widowed state. An undefinable something about the room seemed to suggest masculine habitation. Her great tragedy happened just three years ago, said the child. That would be since your sister's time. Her tragedy? asked Frampton. Somehow in this restful country spot, tragedy seemed out of place. You may wonder why we keep that window wide open on an October afternoon, said the niece, indicating a large French window that opened onto a lawn. It is quite warm for the time of year, said Frampton, but has that window got anything to do with the tragedy? Out through that window, three years ago to a day, her husband and her two young brothers went off for their day's shooting. They never came back and crossing the moor to their favourite snipe shooting ground they were all three engulfed in a treacherous piece of bog it had been that dreadful wet summer you know and places that were safe in other years gave way suddenly without warning their bodies were never recovered that was the dreadful part of it here the child's voice lost its self-possessed note and became falteringly human poor aunt always thinks that they will come back some day they and the little brown spaniel that was lost with them, and walking at that window just as they used to do. That is why the window is kept open every evening till it is quite dark. Poor dear aunt, she has often told me how they went out, her husband with his white waterproof coat over his arm, and Ronnie, her youngest brother, singing, Bertie, why do you bound, as he always did to tease her, because she said it got on her nerves. Do you know, sometimes and still, quiet evenings like this, I almost get a creepy feeling that they will all walk in through that window. She broke off with a little shudder. It was a relief to Frampton when the aunt bustled into the room with a whirl of apologies for being late in making her appearance. I hope Vera has been amusing you, she said. She has been very interesting, said Frampton. I hope you don't mind the open window, said Mrs. Sappleton briskly. 
My husband and brothers will be home directly from shooting, and they always come in this way. They've been out for snipe in the marshes today, so they'll make a fine mess over my poor carpets. So like you men folk, isn't it? She rattled on cheerfully about the shooting and the scarcity of birds and the prospects for ducks in the winter. To Frampton it was all purely horrible. He made a desperate but only partially successful effort to turn her talk onto a less ghastly topic. He was conscious that his hostess was giving him only a fragment of her attention, and her eyes were constantly straying past him to the open window and the lawn beyond. It was certainly an unfortunate coincidence that he should have paid his visit on this tragic anniversary. The doctors agree in ordering me complete rest, an absence of mental excitement, and avoidance of anything in the nature of violent physical exercise, announced Frampton, who labored under the tolerably widespread delusion that total strangers and chance acquaintances are hungry for the least detail of one's ailments and infirmities, their cause and cure. On the matter of diet, they are not so much in agreement, he continued. No, said Mrs. Sappleton, in a voice which only replaced a yawn at the last moment. Then she suddenly brightened into alert attention, but not to what Frampton was saying. Here they are at last, she cried, just in time for tea, and don't they look as if they were muddy up to the eyes? Frampton shivered slightly, and turned towards the niece with a look intended to convey sympathetic comprehension. The child was staring out through the open window with dazed horror in her eyes. In a chill shock of nameless fear, Frampton swung round in his seat and looked in the same direction. In the deepening twilight, three figures were walking across the lawn towards the window. They all carried guns under their arms, and one of them was additionally burdened with a white coat hung over his shoulders. A tired brown spaniel kept close at their heels. Noiselessly, they neared the house, and then a hoarse young voice chanted out of the dusk, "'I say, Bertie, why do you bound?' Frampton grabbed wildly at his stick and hat. The hall door, the gravel drive, and the front gate were dimly noted stages in his headlong retreat. A cyclist coming along the road had to run into the hedge to avoid an imminent collision. "'Here we are, my dear,' said the bearer of the white Mackintosh, coming in through the window. "'Fairly muddy, but most of it's dry.' Who was that who bolted out as we came up? A most extraordinary man, a Mr. Nuttle, said Mrs. Sappleton. He could only talk about his illnesses and dashed off without a word of goodbye or apology when you arrived. One would think he had seen a ghost. I expect it was a spaniel, said the niece calmly. He told me he had a horror of dogs. He was once hunted into a cemetery somewhere on the banks of the Ganges by a pack of pariah dogs, and had to spend the night in a newly dug grave with the creatures snarling and grinning and foaming just above him. Enough to make anyone lose their nerve. Romance at short notice was her specialty. End of The Open Window by Saki The Other Lodgers by Ambrose Bierce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. The Other Lodgers by Ambrose Bierce. In order to take that train, said Colonel Levering, sitting in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, you will have to remain nearly all night in Atlanta. That is a fine city, but I advise you not to put up at the Breathitt House, one of the principal hotels. It is an old wooden building, in urgent need of repairs. There are breaches in the walls that you could throw a cat through. The bedrooms have no locks on the doors, no furniture but a single chair in each, and a bedstead without bedding, just a mattress. Even these meagre accommodations you cannot be sure that you will have in monopoly. You must take your chance of being stowed in with a lot of others. Sir, it is a most abominable hotel. The night that I passed in it was an uncomfortable night. I got in late and was shown to my room on the ground floor, 
by an apologetic night clerk with a tallow candle which he considerately left with me i was worn out by two days and a night of hard railway travel and had not entirely recovered from a gunshot wound in the head received in an altercation rather than look for better quarters i lay down on the mattress without removing my clothing and fell asleep along toward morning i awoke the moon had risen and was shining in at the uncurtained window illuminating the room with a soft bluish light which seemed somehow a bit spooky though i dare say it had no uncommon quality all moonlight is that way if you will observe it imagine my surprise and indignation when i saw the floor occupied by at least a dozen other lodgers I sat up, earnestly damning the management of that unthinkable hotel, and was about to spring from the bed to go and make trouble for the night clerk, him of the apologetic manner and the tallow candle, when something in the situation affected me with a strange indisposition to move. I suppose I was what a story writer might call frozen with terror, for those men were obviously all dead. They lay on their backs, disposed orderly, along three sides of the room, their feet to the walls. Against the other wall, farthest from the door, stood my bed and the chair. All the faces were covered, but under their white cloths the features of the two bodies that lay in the square patch of moonlight near the window showed in sharp profile as to nose and chin. I thought this a bad dream, and tried to cry out, as one does in a nightmare, but could make no sound. At last, with a desperate effort, I threw my feet to the floor, and passing between the two rows of clouted faces and the two bodies that lay nearest the door, I escaped from the infernal place and ran to the office. The night clerk was there, behind the desk, sitting in the dim light of another tallow candle, just sitting and staring. He did not rise. My abrupt entrance produced no effect upon him, though I must have looked a veritable corpse myself. It occurred to me then that I had not before really observed the fellow. He was a little chap with a colorless face and the whitest, blankest eyes I ever saw. He had no more expression than the back of my hand. His clothing was a dirty gray. "'Damn you,' I said. "'What do you mean?' Just the same, I was shaken like a leaf in the wind, and did not recognize my own voice. The night clerk rose, bowed, apologetically, and, well, he was no longer there, and at that moment I felt a hand upon my shoulder from behind. Just fancy that, if you can. Unspeakably frightened, I turned and saw a portly, kind-faced gentleman who asked, "'What is the matter, my friend?' I was not long in telling him, but before I made an end of it, he went pale himself. "'See here,' he said, "'are you telling the truth?' I had now got myself in hand, and terror had given place to indignation. "'If you dare to doubt it,' I said, "'I'll hammer the life out of you.' "'No,' he replied. "'Don't do that. Just sit down till I tell you. This is not a hotel. It used to be. Afterward, it was a hospital. Now it is unoccupied, awaiting a tenant.' The room that you mentioned was a dead room. There were always plenty of dead. The fellow that you call the night clerk used to be that, but later he booked the patients as they were brought in. I don't understand his being here. He has been dead a few weeks. And who are you? I blurted out. Oh, I look after the premises. I happened to be passing just now, and seeing a light in here, came in to investigate. Let us have a look into that room, he added, lifting the sputtering candle from the desk. 
"'I'll see you at the devil first, said I, bolting out the door into the street. "'Sir, that breathed house in Atlanta is a beastly place. Don't you stop there.' God forbid, your account of it certainly does not suggest comfort. By the way, Colonel, when did all that occur? In September, 1864, shortly after the siege. End of The Other Lodgers by Ambrose Bierce The Oval Portrait by Edgar Allan Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Sean Michael Hogan. The Oval Portrait by Edgar Allan Poe. The chateau into which my valet had ventured to make forcible entrance, rather than permit me in my desperately wounded condition to pass a night in the open air, was one of those piles of commingled gloom and grandeur which have so long frowned among the Apennines, not less in fact than in the fancy of Mrs. Radcliffe. To all appearance it had been temporarily and very lately abandoned. We established ourselves in one of the smallest and least sumptuously furnished apartments. It lay in a remote turret of the building. Its decorations were rich, yet tattered and antique. Its walls were hung with tapestry and bedecked with manifold and multiform armorial trophies, together with an unusually great number of very spirited modern paintings in frames of rich golden arabesque. In these paintings, which depended from the walls not only in their main surfaces, but in very many nooks which the bizarre architecture of the chateau rendered necessary, in these paintings my incipient delirium, perhaps, caused me to take deep interest, so that I bade Pedro to close the heavy shutters of the room, since it was already night, to light the tongues of a tall candelabrum which stood by the head of my bed, and to throw open far and wide the fringed curtains of black velvet which enveloped the bed itself. I wished all this done that I might resign myself, if not to sleep, at least alternately to the contemplation of these pictures, and the perusal of a small volume which had been found upon the pillow, and which purported to criticize and describe them. Long, long I read, and devoutly, devoutly I gazed. Rapidly and gloriously the hours flew by, and the deep midnight came. The position of the candelabrum displeased me, and outreaching my hand with difficulty, rather than disturb my slumbering valet, I placed it so as to throw its rays more fully upon the book. But the action produced an effect altogether unanticipated. The rays of the numerous candles, for there were many, now fell within a niche of the room which had hitherto been thrown into deep shade by one of the bedposts. I thus saw in vivid light a picture all unnoticed before. It was the portrait of a young girl just ripening into womanhood. I glanced at the painting hurriedly, and then closed my eyes. Why I did this was not at first apparent even to my own perception. But while my lids remained thus shut, I ran over in my mind my reason for so shutting them. It was an impulsive movement to gain time for thought, to make sure that my vision had not deceived me, to calm and subdue my fancy for a more sober and more certain gaze. In a very few moments I again looked fixedly at the painting. That I now saw aright I could not and would not doubt, for the first flashing of the candles upon that canvas had seemed to dissipate the dreamy stupor which was stealing over my senses, and to startle me at once into waking life. The portrait, I have already said, was that of a young girl. It was a mere head and shoulders, done in what is technically termed a vignette manner, much in the style of the favorite heads of Sully. The arms, the bosom, and even the ends of the radiant hair melted imperceptibly into the vague yet deep shadow which formed the background of the whole. The frame was oval, richly gilded and filigreed and moresque. As a thing of art, nothing could be more admirable than the painting itself, but it could have been neither the execution of the work nor the immortal beauty of the countenance, which had so suddenly and so vehemently moved me. Least of all could it have been that my fancy, shaken from its half-slumber, had mistaken the head for that of a living person. I saw at once that the peculiarities of the design, of the vignetting, and of the frame, must have instantly dispelled such idea, must have prevented even its momentary entertainment. Thinking earnestly upon these points, I remained, for an hour perhaps, half sitting, half reclining, with my vision riveted upon the portrait. At length, satisfied with the true secret of its effect, 
I fell back within the bed. I had found the spell of the picture in an absolute life-likeness of expression, which at first startling, finally confounded, subdued, and appalled me. With deep and reverent awe I replaced the candelabrum in its former position. The cause of my deep agitation being thus shut from view, I sought eagerly the volume which discussed the paintings and their histories. Turning to the number which designated the oval portrait, I there read the vague and quaint words which follow. She was a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee. And evil was the hour when she saw, and loved, and wedded the painter. He, passionate, studious, austere, and having already a bride in his art, she a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee, all light and smiles, and frolicsome as the young fawn, loving and cherishing all things, hating only the art which was her rival, dreading only the palette and brushes and other untoward instruments which deprived her of the countenance of her lover. It was thus a terrible thing for this lady to hear the painter speak of his desire to portray even his young bride. But she was humble and obedient, and sat meekly for many weeks in the dark, high turret-chamber where the light dripped upon the pale canvas only from overhead. But he, the painter, took glory in his work, which went on from hour to hour and from day to day. And he was a passionate and wild and moody man, who became lost in reveries, so that he would not see that the light which fell so ghastly in that lone turret withered the health and the spirits of his bride, who pined visibly to all but him. Yet she smiled on and still on, uncomplainingly, because she saw that the painter, who had high renown, took a fervid and burning pleasure in his task, and wrought day and night to depict her who so loved him, yet who grew daily more dispirited and weak. And in sooth some who beheld the portrait spoke of its resemblance in low words as of a mighty marvel, and a proof not less of the power of the painter than of his deep love for her whom he depicted so surpassingly well. But at length, as the labor drew nearer to its conclusion, there were admitted none into the turret, for the painter had grown wild with the ardor of his work, and turned his eyes from canvas merely, even to regard the countenance of his wife, and he would not see that the tints which he spread upon the canvas were drawn from the cheeks of her who sat beside him, and when many weeks had passed and but little remained to do, save one brush upon the mouth and one tint upon the eye, the spirit of the lady again flickered up as the flame within the socket of the lamp, and then the brush was given, and then the tint was placed, and for one moment the painter stood entranced before the work which he had wrought, but in the next, while he yet gazed, he grew tremulous and very pallid, and aghast, and crying with a loud voice, This is indeed life itself, turned suddenly to regard his beloved. She was dead. End of The Oval Portrait Reading by Sean Michael Hogan, St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada Present and a Hanging by Ambrose Beers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Today's reading by Tom Hackett djhackett.newgrounds.com and hungry for work at voiceactingalliance.com Present at a Hanging by Ambrose Beers An old man named Daniel Baker, living near Lebanon, Iowa, was suspected by his neighbors of having murdered a peddler who had obtained permission to pass the night at his house. This was in 1853, when peddling was more common in the western country than it is now, and was attended with considerable danger. The peddler, with his pack, traversed the country by all manner of lonely roads, and was compelled to rely upon the country people for hospitality. This brought him into a relation with queer characters, some of whom were not altogether scrupulous in their methods of making a living, murder being an acceptable means to that end. It occasionally occurred that a peddler with diminished pack and swollen purse would be traced to the lonely dwelling of some rough character, and never could be traced beyond. This was so in the case of Old Man Baker, as he was always called. Such names are given in the western settlements only to elderly persons who are not esteemed. To the general disrepute of social unworth is affixed the special reproach of age. A peddler came to his house, and none went away. That is all that anybody knew. 
Seven years later, the Reverend Mr. Cummings, a Baptist minister well known in that part of the country, was driving by Baker's farm one night. It was not very dark. There was a bit of moon somewhere above the light veil of mist that lay along the earth. Mr. Cummings, who was at all times a cheerful person, was whistling a tune, which he would occasionally interrupt to speak a word of friendly encouragement to his horse. As he came to a little bridge across a dry ravine, he saw the figure of a man standing upon it, clearly outlined against the gray background of a misty forest. The man had something strapped on his back and carried a heavy stick, obviously an iditerant peddler. His attitude had in it a suggestion of abstraction, like that of a sleepwalker. Mr. Cummings reined in his horse when he arrived in front of him, gave him a pleasant salutation, and invited him to a seat in the vehicle. If you are going my way, he added. The man raised his head, looked him full in the face, but neither answered nor made any further movement. The minister, with good-natured persistence, repeated his invitation. At this, the man threw his right hand forward from his side and pointed downward as he stood on the extreme edge of the bridge. Mr. Cummings looked past him, over into the ravine, saw nothing unusual, and withdrew his eyes to address the man again. He had disappeared. The horse, which all this time had been uncommonly restless, gave at the same moment a snort of terror and started to run away. Before he had regained control of the animal, the minister was at the crest of the hill a hundred yards along. He looked back and saw the figure again, in the same place and in the same attitude as when he had first observed it. Then, for the first time, he was conscious of a sense of the supernatural, and drove home as rapidly as his willing horse would go. On arriving at home, he related his adventure to his family, and early the next morning, accompanied by two neighbors, John White Corwell and Abner Razor, returned to the spot. They found the body of old man Baker hanging by the neck from one of the beams of the bridge, immediately beneath the spot where the apparition had stood. A thick coating of dust, slightly dampened by the mist, covered the floor of the bridge but the only footprints were those of Mr. Cummings' horse. In taking down the body, the men disturbed the loose frail earth of the slope below it, disclosing human bones already nearly uncovered by the action of water and frost. They were identified as those of the lost peddler. At the double inquest, the coroner's jury found that Daniel Baker died by his own hand while suffering from temporary insanity, and that Samuel Moritz was murdered by some person or persons to the jury unknown. End of Present at a Hanging by Ambrose Beers Read by Tom Hackett djhackett.newgrounds.com And Hungry for Work at voiceactingalliance.com The Strange Disappearance of Mr. Jeremiah Dance By Elliot O'Donnell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times The Strange Disappearance of Mr. Jeremiah Dance by Elliot O'Donnell Twenty pounds a year for a twelve-roomed house, with large front lawn, good stabling, and big kitchen gardens. That sounds all right, I commented, but why so cheap? Well, the advertiser, Mr. Baldwin by name, a short, stout gentleman with keen, glittering eyes, replied, Well, you see, it's a bit of a distance from the town, and, er, most people prefer being nearer, like neighbors and all that sort of thing. Like neighbors? I exclaimed. I don't. I've just seen about enough of them. Drains all right? Oh, yes, perfect. Water. Excellent. Everything in good condition. First rate. Loneliness the only thing that people object to? That is so. Then I'll oblige you to send someone to show me over the house, for I think it is just the sort of place we want. You see, after being bottled up in a theater all the afternoon and evening, one likes to get away somewhere where it is quiet somewhere where one can lie in bed in the morning, inhaling pure air and undisturbed by street traffic. I understand, Mr. Baldwin responded. But, er, it is rather late now. Wouldn't you prefer to see it over in the morning? Everything looks at its worst, its very worst, in the twilight. Oh, I'll make allowances for the dusk, I said. You haven't got any ghosts stowed away there, have you? 
and he went off into a roar of laughter. <laughs> no, the house is not haunted, Mr. Baldwin replied. Not that it would much matter to you if it were, for I can see you don't believe in spooks. Believe in spooks? I cried. Not much. I would as soon believe in patent hair restorers. Let me see it over at once. Very well, sir. I'll take you there myself, Mr. Baldwin replied, somewhat reluctantly. Here, Tim, fetch the keys of the crow's nest, and tell Higgins to bring the trap round. The boy he addressed flew, and in a few minutes the sound of wheels and the jingling of harness announced the vehicle was at the door. Ten minutes later, and I and my escort were bowling merrily over the ground in the direction of the crow's nest. It was early autumn, and the cool evening air, fragrant with the mellowness of the luscious Virginian pippin, was tinged also with the sadness inseparable from the demise of a long and glorious summer. Evidences of decay and death were everywhere, in the brown fallen leaves of the oaks and elms, in the bare and denuded ditches. Here a giant mill-wheel, half immersed in a dark still pool, stood idle and silent. There a hovel, but recently inhabited by hop-pickers, was now tenantless, its glassless windows boarded over, and a wealth of death and rotting vegetable matter in thick profusion over the tiny path and the single stone doorstep. "'Is it always as quiet and deserted as this?' I asked of my companion, who continually cracked his whip, as if he liked to hear the reverberations of its echoes. "'Always,' was the reply, "'and sometimes more so. You ain't used to the country.' "'Not very. I want to try it by way of a change. Are you well versed in the cry of birds?' What was that? We were fast approaching an exceedingly gloomy bit of the road, where there were plantations on each side, and the trees united their fantastically forked branches overhead. I thought I had never seen so dismal-looking a spot, and a sudden lowering of the temperature made me draw my overcoat tighter round me. That? Oh, a nightbird of some sort. Mr. Baldwin replied. An ugly sound, wasn't it? Beastly things. I can't imagine why they were created. Whoa! Steady there, steady. The horse reared as he spoke, and taking a violent plunge forward, set off at a wild gallop. A moment later, and I uttered an exclamation of astonishment. Keeping pace with us, although apparently not moving at more than an ordinary walking pace, was a man of medium height, dressed in a Panama hat and Albert coat. He had a thin aquiline nose, a rather pronounced chin, was clean-shaven, and had a startlingly white complexion. By the side of him trotted two poodles, whose close-cropped skins showed out with remarkable perspicuity. "'Who the deuce is he?' I asked raising my voice to a shout, on account of the loud clatter made by the horse's hoofs and the wheels. "'Who? What?' Mr. Baldwin shouted in return. "'Why, the man walking along with us.' "'Man? I can't see no man,' Mr. Baldwin growled. I looked at him curiously. It may, of course, have been due to the terrific speed we were going, to the difficulty of holding in the horse, but his cheeks were ashy pale, and his teeth chattered. "'Do you mean to say,' I cried, "'that you can see no figure walking on my side of the horse, and actually keeping pace with it?' "'Of course I can't,' Mr. Baldwin snapped. "'It's an hallucination, caused by the moonlight through the branches overhead. I've experienced it more than once.' "'Then why don't you have it now?' I queried. "'Don't ask so many questions, please,' Mr. Baldwin shouted. "'Don't you see it is as much as I can do to hold the brute in? "'Heaven preserve us! We were nearly over that time!' The trap rose high in the air as he spoke, and then dropped with such a jolt that I was nearly thrown off, and only saved myself by the skin of my teeth. A few yards more the spinney ceased, and we were away out in the open country, plunging and galloping as if our very souls depended on it. 
from all sides queer and fantastic shadows of objects which certainly had no material counterparts in the moon kissed sward of the rich ripe meadows rose to greet us and filled the lane with their black and white wavering ethereal forms the evening was one of wonders for which i had no name wonders associated with an iciness that was far from agreeable i was not at all sure which i liked best the black stygian tree-lined part of the road we had just left or the wide ocean of brilliant moonbeams and street suggestions the figures of the man and the dogs were equally vivid in each though i could no longer doubt they were nothing mortal they were altogether unlike what i had imagined ghosts like the generality of people who are psychic and who have never had an experience of the superphysical my conception of a phantasm was a thing in white that made ridiculous groanings and still more ridiculous clankings of chains but here was something different something that looked save perhaps for the excessive pallor of its cheeks just like an ordinary man i knew it was not a man partly on account of its extraordinary performance no man even if running at full speed could keep up with us like that partly on account of the unusual nature of the atmosphere which was altogether indefinable it brought with it and also because of my own sensations my intense horror which could not i felt certain have been generated by anything physical i cogitated all this in my mind as i gazed at the figure and in order to make sure it was no hallucination i shut first one eye and then the other covering them alternately with the palm of my hand the figure however was still there still pacing along at our side with the regular swing swing of the born walker we kept on in this fashion till we arrived at a rusty iron gate leading by means of a weed-covered path to a low two-story white house here the figures left us and as it seemed to me vanished at the foot of the garden wall this is the house mr baldwin panted pulling up with the greatest difficulty the horse evincing obvious antipathy to the iron gate and these are the keys I'm afraid you must go in alone, as I dare not leave the animal even for a minute. Oh, all right, I said. I don't mind. Now that the ghost, or whatever you like to call it, has gone, I'm myself again. I jumped down, and, threading my way through the bramble-entangled path, reached the front door. On opening it, I hesitated. The big, old-fashioned hall, with the great frowning staircase leading to the gallery overhead, the many open doors showing naught but bare deserted boards within the grim passages all moonlit and peopled only with queer flickering shadows suggested much that was terrifying i fancied i heard noises noises like stealthy footsteps moving from room to room and tiptoeing along the passages and down the staircase once my heart almost stopped beating as i saw what at first I took to be a white face peering at me from a far recess, but which I eventually discovered was only a daub of whitewash, and, once again, my hair all but rose on end when one of the doors at which I was looking swung open and something came forth. Oh, the horror of that moment! As long as I live, I shall never forget it. The something was a cat, just a rather lean but otherwise material black tom, yet in the state my nerves were then it created almost as much horror as if it had been a ghost of course it was the figure of the walking man that was the cause of all this nervousness had it not appeared to me i should doubtless have entered the house with the utmost sang-froid my mind set on nothing but the condition of the walls drains etc as it was i held back and it was only after a severe mental struggle I summoned up the courage to leave the doorway and explore. Cautiously, very cautiously, with my heart in my mouth, I moved from room to room, halting every now and then in dreadful suspense as the wind, sowing through across the open land behind the house, blew down the chimneys and set the window frames jarring. 
At the commencement of one of the passages, I was immeasurably startled to see a dark shape poke forward and then spring hurriedly back, and was so frightened that I dared not advance to see what it was. Moment after moment sped by, and I still stood there, the cold sweat oozing out all over me, and my eyes fixed in hideous expectation on the blank wall. What was it? What was hiding there? Would it spring out on me if I went to see? At last, urged on by a fascination I found impossible to resist, I crept down the passage, my heart throbbing painfully, and my whole being overcome with the most sickly anticipations. As I drew nearer to the spot, it was as much as I could do to breathe, and my respiration came in quick jerks and gasps. Six, five, four, two feet, and I was at the dreaded angle. Another step, taken after the most prodigious battle, and nothing sprang out on me. I was confronted only with a large piece of paper that had come loose from the wall, and flapped backwards and forwards each time the breeze from without rustled past it. The reaction, after such an agony of suspense, was so great that I leaned against the wall and laughed till I cried. A noise, from somewhere away in the basement, calling me to myself, I went downstairs and investigated. Again a shock, this time more sudden, more acute. Pressed against the window-pane of one of the front reception rooms was the face of a man, with corpse-like cheeks and pale, malevolent eyes. I was petrified. Every drop of my blood was congealed. My tongue glued to my mouth. My arms hung helpless. I stood in the doorway and stared at it. This went on for what seemed to me an eternity. Then came a revelation. The face was not that of a ghost, but of Mr. Baldwin, who, getting alarmed at my long absence, had come to look for me. We left the premises together. All the way back to the town, I thought, should I, or should I not, take the house? Seen as I had seen it, it was a ghoulish-looking place, as weird as a Paris catacomb, but then daylight makes all the difference. Viewed in the sunshine, it would be just like any other house, plain bricks and mortar. I liked the situation. It was just far enough away from town to enable me to escape all the smoke and traffic, and near enough to make shopping easy. The only obstacles were the shadows, the strange, enigmatical shadows I had seen in the hall and passages, and the figure of the walker. Dare I take a house that knew such visitors? At first I said no, and then yes. Something, I could not tell what, urged me to say yes. I felt that a very grave issue was at stake, that of a great wrong connected in some manner with a mysterious figure awaited writing, and that the hand of fate pointed at me as the one and only person who could do it. "'Are you sure the house isn't haunted?' I demanded, as we slowly rolled away from the iron gate, and I leaned back in my seat to light my pipe. "'Haunted?' Mr. Baldwin scoffed. "'Why, I thought you didn't believe in ghosts. Laughed at them.' "'No more I do believe in them,' I retorted. "'But I have children, and we know how imaginative children are. "'I can't undertake to stop their imaginations.' No, but you can tell me whether anyone else has imagined anything there. Imagination is sometimes very infectious. As far as I know, then, no. Leastways, I have not heard tell of it. Who is the last tenant? Mr. Jeremiah Dance. Why did he leave? How do I know? Got tired of being there, I suppose. How long was he there? Nearly three years. Where is he now? That's more than I can say. Why do you wish to know? Why, I repeated, because it is more satisfactory to me to hear about the house from someone who has lived in it. Has he left no address? Not that I know of, and it's more than two years since he was here. What? The house has been empty all that time? 
Two years is not very long. Houses, even town houses, are frequently unoccupied for longer than that. I think you'll like it. I did not speak again till the drive was over, and we drew up outside the landlord's house. I then said, Let me have an agreement. I've made up my mind to take it. Three years and the option to stay on. That was just like me. Whatever I did, I did on the spur of the moment, a mode of procedure that often led me into difficulties. A month later, and my wife, children, servants, and I were all ensconced in the crow's nest. That was the beginning of October. Well, the month passed by, and November was fairly in before anything remarkable happened. It then came about in this fashion. Jenny, my eldest child, a self-willed and rather bad-tempered girl of about twelve, evading the vigilance of her mother, who had forbidden her to go out as she had a cold, ran to the gate one evening to see if I was anywhere in sight. Though barely five o'clock, the moon was high in the sky, and the shadows of the big trees had already commenced their gambols along the roadside. Jenny clambered up the gate, as children do, and peering over, suddenly espied what she took to be me, striding towards the house at a swinging pace, and followed by two poodles. Papa, she cried, how cute of you, only to think of you bringing home two doggies. Oh, Papa, naughty Papa, what will Mum say? And climbing over into the lane, at imminent danger to life and limb, she tore frantically towards the figure. To her dismay, however, it was not me, but a stranger with a horribly white face and big glassy eyes, which he turned down on her and stared. She was so frightened that she fainted, and some ten minutes later I found her lying out there on the road. From the description she gave me of the man and dogs, I felt quite certain they were the figures I had seen, though I pretended the man was a tramp, and assured her she would never see him again. A week passed, and I was beginning to hope nothing would happen, when one of the servants gave notice to leave. At first she would not say why she did not like the house, but when pressed, made the following statement. It's haunted, Mrs. B. I can put up with mice and beetles, but not with ghosts. I've had a queer sensation, as if water was following down my spine ever since I've been here but never saw anything till last night. I was then in the kitchen getting ready to go to bed. Jane and Emma had already gone up, and I was preparing to follow them, when, all of a sudden, I heard footsteps, quick and heavy, cross the gravel and approach the window. The boss, says I to myself, maybe he's forgot the key and can't get in at the front door. Well, I went to the window, and was about to throw it open when I got an awful shock. Pressed against the glass, looking in at me, was a face. Not the boss's face, not the face of anyone living, but a horrid white thing with a drooping mouth and wide-open glassy eyes that had no more expression in them than a pig. As sure as I'm standing here, Mrs. B., it was the face of a corpse, the face of a man that had died no natural death, and by its side, standing on their hind legs, and staring in at me, too, were two dogs, both poodles, also no living things, but dead, horribly dead. Well, they stared at me, all three of them, for perhaps a minute, certainly not less, and then vanished. That's why I'm leaving, Mrs. B. My heart was never overstrong. I always suffered with palpitations, and if I saw those heads again, it would kill me. After this, my wife spoke to me seriously. Jack, she said, are you sure there's nothing in it? I don't think Mary would leave us without a good cause, and the description of what she saw tallies exactly with the figure that frightened Jenny. <coughs> Jenny assures me she never said a word about it to the servants. They can't both have imagined it. I did not know what to say. My conscience pricked me. 
Without a doubt, I ought to have told my wife of my own experience in the lane, and have consulted her before taking the house. Supposing she, or any of the children, should die of fright, it would be my fault. I should never forgive myself. "'You've something on your mind. What is it?' my wife demanded. I hesitated a moment or two, and then told her. The next quarter of an hour was one I do not care to recollect, but when it was over, and she had had her say, it was decided I should make inquiries, and see if there was any possible way of getting rid of the ghosts. With this end in view, I drove to the town, and after several fruitless efforts, was at length introduced to a Mr. Marsden, clerk of one of the banks, who, in reply to my questions, said, "'Well, Mr. B., it's just this way. I do know something, only, in a small place like this, one has to be so extra careful what one says. Some years ago, a Mr. Jeremiah Dance occupied the crow's nest. He came here, apparently, a total stranger, and though often in the town, was only seen in the company of one person, his landlord, Mr. Baldwin, with whom, if local gossip is to be relied on, he appeared to be on terms of the greatest familiarity. Indeed, they were seldom apart, walked about the lanes arm in arm, visited each other's houses on alternate evenings, called each other Teddy and Leslie. This state of things continued for nearly three years, and then people suddenly began to comment on the fact that Mr. Dance had gone, or at least was no longer visible. And Aaron Boy, returning back to town late one evening, swore to being passed on the way by a trap containing Mr. Baldwin and Mr. Dance, who were speaking in very loud voices, just as if they were having a violent altercation. On reaching that part of the road where the trees are thickest overhead, the lad overtook them, or rather Mr. Baldwin, preparing to mount into the trap. Mr. Dance was nowhere to be seen. And from that day to this, nothing has ever been heard of him. As none of his friends or relations came forward to raise inquiries, and all his bills were paid, several of them by Mr. Baldwin, no one took the matter up. Mr. Baldwin pooh-poohed the errand boy's story, and declared that, on the night in question, he had been alone in an altogether different part of the county, and knew nothing whatever of Mr. Dance's movements, further than that he had recently announced his intention of leaving the crow's nest, before the expiration of the three years' lease. He had not the remotest idea where he was. He claimed the furniture in payment of the rent due to him. Did the matter end there? I asked. In one sense of the word, yes. In another, no. Within a few weeks of Dance's disappearance, rumors got afloat that his ghost had been seen on the road, just where, you may say, you saw it. As a matter of fact, I've seen it myself, and so have crowds of other people. Has anyone ever spoken to it? Yes, and it has vanished at once. I went there one night with the purpose of laying it, but on its appearing suddenly, I confess, I was so startled that I had not only forgot what I rehearsed to say, but ran home without uttering as much as a word. And what are your deductions of the case? The same as everyone else's, Mr. Marsden whispered, only, like everyone else, I dare not say. Had Mr. Dance any dogs? Yes, two poodles, of which, much to Mr. Baldwin's annoyance, everyone noticed this. He used to make the most ridiculous fuss. Humph, I observed. That settles it. Ghosts. And to think I never believed in them before. Well, I am going to try. Try what? Mr. Marsden said, a note of alarm in his voice. Try laying it. I have an idea I may succeed. I wish you luck, then. May I come with you? Thanks. No, I rejoined. I would rather go there alone. I said this in a well-lighted room, 
with the hum of a crowded thoroughfare in my ears. Twenty minutes later, when I had left all that behind, and was fast approaching the darkest part of an exceptionally dark road, I wished I had not. At the very spot where I had previously seen the figures, I saw them now. They suddenly appeared by my side, and though I was going at a great rate, for the horse took fright, they kept easy pace with me. Twice I essayed to speak to them, but could not ejaculate a syllable through sheer horror and it was only by nerving myself to the utmost, and forcing my eyes away from them, that I was able to stick to my seat and hold on to the reins. On and on we dashed, until trees, road, sky, universe, were obliterated in one blinding whirlwind that got up my nostrils, choked my ears, and deadened me to everything, save the all-terrorizing instinctive knowledge that the figures by my side were still there, stalking along as quietly and leisurely as if the horse had been going at a snail's pace. At last, to my intense relief, for never had the ride seemed longer, I reached the crow's nest, and as I hurriedly dismounted from the trap, the figure shot past me and vanished. Once inside the house, and in the bosom of my family, where all was light and laughter, courage returned, and I upbraided myself bitterly for this cowardice. I confessed to my wife, and she insisted on accompanying me the following afternoon, at twilight, to the spot where the ghost appeared to originate. To our intense dismay, we had not been there more than three or four minutes, before Dora, our youngest girl, a pretty, sweet-tempered child of eight, came running up to us with a telegram, which one of the servants had asked her to give us. My wife, snatching it from her, and reading it, was about to scold her severely, when she suddenly paused, and, clutching hold of the child with one hand, pointed hysterically at something on one side of her with the other. I looked, and Dora looked, and we both saw, standing erect and staring at us, the spare figure of a man, with a ghastly white face and dull, lifeless eyes, clad in a Panama hat, Albert coat, and small patent leather boots. Beside him were two glossy, abnormally glossy, poodles. I tried to speak, but, as before, was too frightened to articulate a sound, and my wife was in the same plight. With Dora, however, it was otherwise, and she electrified us by going up to the figure and exclaiming, "'Who are you? You must be very ill to look so white. Tell me your name.' The figure made no reply, but gliding slowly forward, moved up to a large isolated oak, and pointing with the index finger of its left hand at the trunk of the tree, seemingly sank into the earth and vanished from view. For some seconds everyone was silent, and then my wife exclaimed, "'Jack, I shouldn't wonder if Dora hasn't been the means of solving the mystery. Examine the tree closely.' I did so. The tree was hollow, and inside it were three skeletons. End of the Strange Disappearance of Mr. Jeremiah Dance The Terrible Old Man by H. P. Lovecraft This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by P. D. Wright The Terrible Old Man by H. P. Lovecraft It was the design of Angelo Ricci and John Zanuck and Manuel Silva to call on the terrible old man. This old man dwells all alone in a very ancient house on Water Street near the sea, 
and is reputed to be both exceedingly rich and exceedingly feeble, which forms a situation very attractive to men of the profession of Mercer's Ritchie, Sanic, and Silva, for that profession was nothing less dignified than robbery. The inhabitants of Kingsport say and think many things about the terrible old man, which generally keeps him safe from the attention of gentlemen like Mr. Ritchie and his colleagues, despite the almost certain fact that he hides a fortune of indefinite magnitude somewhere about his musty and venerable abode. He is, in truth, a very strange person, believed to have been a captain of East India clipper ships in his day, so old that no one can remember when he was young, and so taciturn that few know his real name. Among the gnarled trees in the front yard of his aged and neglected place, he maintains a strange collection of large stones, oddly grouped and painted, so that they resemble the idols of some obscure eastern temple. This collection frightens away most of the small boys who love to taunt the terrible old man about his long white hair and beard or to break the small paned windows of his dwelling with wicked missiles. But there are other things which frighten the older and more curious folks who sometimes steal up to the house to peer in through the dusty panes. These folks say that on a table in a bare room on the ground floor are many peculiar bottles, in each a small piece of lead suspended pendulum-wise from a string. And they say that the terrible old man talks to these bottles, addressing them by such names as Jack, Scarface, Long Tom, Spanish Joe, Peters, and Mate Ellis, and that whenever he speaks to a bottle, the little lead pendulum within makes certain definite vibrations as if it answer. Those who have watched the tall, lean, terrible old man in these peculiar conversations do not watch him again. But Angelo Ritchie and Joe Sasnick and Manuel Silva were not of Kingsport blood. They were of that new and heterogeneous alien stock which lies outside the charmed circle of New England life and traditions, and they saw in the terrible old man merely a tottering, almost helpless graybeard who could not walk without the aid of his knotted cane and whose thin, weak hands shook pitifully. They were really quite sorry in their way for the lonely, unpopular old fellow whom everybody shunned and at whom all the dogs barked singularly. But business is business, and to a robber whose soul is in his profession, there is a lure and a talent but a very old and very feeble man who has no account at the bank and who pays for a few necessities at the village store with Spanish gold and silver minted two centuries ago. Messrs. Ritchie, Sesnick, and Silva selected the night of April 11th for their call. Mr. Ritchie and Mr. Silva were to interview the poor old gentleman, while Mr. Sasnick waited for them in their presumable metallic burden with a covered motor car in Ship Street by the gate in the tall rear wall of their host's grounds. Desire to avoid needless explanations in case of unexpected police intrusions prompted these plans for a quiet and unobstinious departure. As prearranged, the three adventurers started out separately in order to prevent any evil-minded suspicions afterwards. Messrs. Ritchie and Silva met in Water Street by the old man's front gate and although they did not like the way the moon shone down upon the painted stones through the budding branches of the gnarled trees, they had more important things to think about than mere idle superstition. They feared it might be unpleasant work, making the terrible old man loquacious concerning his hoarded gold and silver, for aged sea captains are notably stubborn and perverse. Still, he was very old and very feeble, 
and there were two visitors. Messrs. Ritchie and Silva were experienced in the art of making unwilling persons voluble, and the screams of a weak and exceptionally vulnerable old man could be easily muffled. So they moved up to the only lighted window and heard the terrible old man talking childishly to his bottles with pendulums. Then they donned a mask and nodded politely at the weather-stained oaken door. Waiting seemed very long to Mr. Sasnick, as he fidgeted restlessly in the covered motor car by the terrible old man's back gate in Ship Street. He was more than ordinarily tender-hearted, and he did not like the hideous screams that he had heard in the ancient house just after the hour appointed for the deed. Had he not told his colleagues to be as gentle as possible with the pathetic old sea captain? Very nervously he watched that narrow oaken gate in the high and ivy-clad stone wall. Frequently he consulted his watch and wondered at the delay. Had the old man died before revealing where his treasure was hidden, and had a thorough search become necessary, Mr. Sasnick did not like to wait so long in the dark in such a place. Then he sensed a soft tread or tapping on the walk inside the gate, heard a gentle fumbling at the rusty latch, and saw the narrow heavy door swing inward. And in the pallid glow of the single dim street light, he strained his eye to see what his colleagues had brought out of that sinister house which loomed so close behind. But when he looked, he did not see what he had expected for his colleagues were not there at all, but only the terrible old man, leaning quietly on his knotted cane and smiling hideously. Mr. Sasnick had never before noticed the color of that man's eyes. Now he saw that they were yellow. Little things make considerable excitement in little towns, which is the reason that Kingsport people talked all that spring in summer about the three unidentifiable bodies horribly slashed as with many cutlasses and horribly mangled as by the tread of many cruel boat heels, which the tide washed in, and some people even spoke of things as trivial as the deserted motor car found in Ship Street are of certain especially inhuman cries, probably of a stray animal, a migratory bird, heard in the night by wakeful citizens. But in this idle village gossip the terrible old man took no interest at all. He was by nature reserved, and when one is old and feeble, one's reserve is doubly strong. Besides, so ancient a sea captain must have witnessed scores of things much more stirring in the far-off days of his unremembered youth. End of the Terrible Old Man Recording by P. D. Wright This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Voice in the Night by William Hope Hodgson It was a dark, starless night. We were becalmed in the northern Pacific. Our exact position I do not know, for the sun had been hidden during the course of a weary, breathless week by a thin haze which seemed to float above us, about the height of our mastheads, at whiles descending and shrouding the surrounding sea. With there being no wind, we had steadied the tiller, and I was the only man on deck. The crew consisting of two men and a boy, were sleeping far under in their den, while Will, my friend and the master of our little craft, was aft in his bunk on the port side of the little cabin. Suddenly, from out of the surrounding darkness, there came a hail. Schooner, ahoy! The cry was so unexpected that I gave no immediate answer 
because of my surprise. It came again, a voice curiously throaty and inhuman calling from somewhere upon the dark sea away on our port broadside. Sooner, ahoy! Hello, I sung out, having gathered my wit somewhat. What are you? What do you want? You need not be afraid, answered the queer voice, having probably noticed some trace of confusion in my tone. I am only an old man. The pause sounded oddly, but it was only afterwards that it came back to me with any significance. Why don't you come alongside, then? I queried somewhat snappishly, for I liked not his handing and my having been a trifle shaken. I... Uh, I can't! It wouldn't be safe. I... The voice broke off, and there was silence. What do you mean? I asked, growing more and more astonished. Why not safe? Where are you? I listened for a moment, but there came no answer, and then a sudden indefinite suspicion of I know not what coming to me. I stepped swiftly to the binnacle and took out the lighted lamp. At the same time, I knocked on the deck with my heel to waken Will. Then I was back at the side, throwing the yellow funnel of light out into the silent immensity beyond our rail. As I did so, I heard a slight muffled cry and then the sound of a splash, as though someone had dipped oars abruptly. Yet I cannot say that I saw anything with certainty, save, it seemed to me, that with the first flash of the light there had been something upon the water where now there was nothing. Hello there! I called. What foolery is this? But there came only the indistinct sounds of a boat being pulled away into the night. Then I heard Will's voice from the direction of the after scuttle. What's up, George? Come here, Will, I said. What is it? he asked, coming across the deck. I told him the queer thing which had happened. He put several questions. Then, after a moment's silence, he raised his hands to his lips and hailed, Boat, ahoy! From a long distance away there came back to us a faint reply, and my companion repeated his call. Presently, after a short period of silence, there grew on our hearing the muffled sound of oars, at which Will held again. This time there was a reply. Put away the light! I'll be damned if I will, I muttered. But Will told me to do as the voice bade, and I shoved it down under the bulwarks. Come there, he said, and the oat strokes continued. Then, when apparently some half-dozen fathoms distance, they again ceased. Come alongside, exclaimed Will. There's nothing to be frightened of on board here. Promise that you will not show the light. What's it do with you? I bust out. That you're so infernally afraid of the light. Because, began the voice, and stopped short. Because of what? I asked quickly. Will put a hand on my shoulder. Shut up a minute, old man, he said in a low voice. Let me tackle in. He leaned more over the rail. See here, mister, this is a pretty queer business. You coming upon us like this, right out in the middle of the blessed Pacific? How are we to know what sort of hanky-panky trick you're up to? You say there's only one of you. How are we to know, unless we get a squint at you, eh? What's your objection to the light, anyway? As he finished, I heard the noise of the oars again, and then the voice came, but now from a greater distance, and it's sounding extremely hopeless and pathetic. I, I am sorry. Sorry, I would not have troubled you, only I am hungry, and so is she. The voice died away. The sound of the oars dipping irregularly was borne to us. Stop, sung out Will. I don't want to drive you away. Come back. We'll keep the light hidden if you don't like it. He turned to me. It's a damn queer rig, this. But I think there's nothing to be afraid of. There was a question in his tone. And I replied, No, I think the port has been wrecked around here and gone crazy. The sound of the oars drew nearer. Shove that lamp back in the binnacle, said Will. Then he leaned over the rail and listened. I replaced the lamp and came back to his side. The dipping of the oars ceased some dozen yards distance. 
"'Won't you come alongside now?' asked Will in an even voice. "'I have had the lamp put back in the binnacle.' "'I, I, I cannot,' replied the voice. "'I dare not come nearer. "'I dare not even pay for the, the provisions.' "'That's all right,' said Will, and hesitated. "'You're welcome to as much grub as you can take.' Again he hesitated. "'You are very good,' claimed the voice. "'May God, who understands everything, reward you—' He broke off hustily. "'The, the lady,' said Will abruptly, "'is she—I have left her behind upon the island,' came the voice. "'What island?' I cut in. "'I know not its name,' returned the voice. "'I would to God—' It began, then checked itself as suddenly— "'Could we not send a boat for her?' asked Will at this point. "'No!' said the boys, with extraordinary impotence. "'My God! No!' There was a moment's pause, then it added, in a tone which seemed a merited reproach. "'It was because of our want I ventured, because her agony tortured me.' "'I am a forgetful brute,' exclaimed Will. "'Just wait a minute, whoever you are, and I will bring you up something at once.' In a couple of minutes he was back, and his arms were full of various edibles. He paused at the rail. "'Can't you come alongside for them?' he asked. "'No, no, I, I dare not,' replied the voice, and it seemed to me that in its tone I detected a note of stifled craving. As though the owner hushed a mortal desire, it came to me then in a flash that the poor old creature out there in the darkness was suffering from actual need of that which Will held in his arms, and yet, because of some unintelligible dread, refraining from dashing to the side of our little schooner and receiving it. And with a lightning-like conviction there came the knowledge that the Invisible was not mad, but sanely facing some intolerable horror. "'Damn it, Will!' I said, full of many feelings, over which— predominated a vast sympathy. Get a box. We must float off the stuff to him in it. This we did, propelling it away from the vessel out into the darkness by means of a boat hook. In a minute a slight cry from the invisible came to us, and we knew that he had secured the box. A little later he caught out a farewell to us, and so heartfelt a blessing that I am sure we were the better for it. Then, without much ado, we heard the ply of oars across the darkness. "'Pretty soon off,' remarked Will, with perhaps just a little sense of injury. "'Wait,' I replied. "'I think somehow he'll be back. He must have been badly needing that food.' "'And the lady,' said Will. For a moment he was silent. Then he continued, "'It's the queerest thing I've ever tumbled across since I've been fishing.' "'Yes,' I said, and fell to pondering. And so the time slipped away, an hour, another, and still Will stayed with me, for the queer adventure had knocked all desire for sleep out of him. And the third hour was three parts through when we heard again the sound of oars across the silent ocean. Listen, said Will, in a low note of excitement in his voice. He's coming, just as I thought, I muttered. The dipping of the oars grew nearer, and I noted that the strokes were firmer and longer. The food had been needed. They came to a stop a little distance off the broadside, and the queer voice came again to us through the darkness. Schooner, ahoy! That you? asked Will. Yes, replied the voice. I left you suddenly, but, but there was great need. The lady? questioned Will. The... Lady is grateful now on earth. She will be more grateful soon in in heaven. Will began to make some reply in a puzzled voice, but came confused and broke off short. I said nothing. I was wondering at the curious pauses, and, apart from my wonder, I was full of great sympathy. The voice continued. We, she and I, have talked, as we shared the result of God's tenderness and yours, Will interposed but without coherence. I beg of you not to to belittle your deed of Christian charity this night, said the voice. Be sure that it has not escaped his notice. There was a full minute's silence. Then it came again. 
We have spoken together upon that which, which has befallen us. We had thought to go out without telling any of the terror which has come into our lives. She is with me in believing that tonight's happenings are under a special ruling, that it is God's wish that we should tell you all that we have suffered since, since, yes, said Will softly. Since the sinking of the albatross, ah, I exclaimed involuntarily, she left Newcastle for Frisco some six months ago, and hasn't been heard of since. Yes, answered the voice, but some few degrees to the north of the line, she was caught in a terrible storm and dismasted. When the day came and it was found that she was leaking badly and presently it falling to a calm, the sailors took to the boats, leaving leaving a young lady, my fiancé, and myself upon the wreck. We were below, gathering together a few of our belongings when they left. They were entirely callous through fear, and when we came up upon the deck we saw them only as small shapes afar off upon the horizon. Yet we did not despair was set to work and constructed a small raft. Upon this we put such few matters as it would hold, including a quantity of water and some ship's biscuits. Then, the vessel being very deep in the water, we got ourselves onto the raft and pushed off. It was later when I observed that we seemed to be in the way of some tide or current which bore us from the ship at an angle, so that in the course of three hours by my watch her hull became invisible to our sight, her broken masks remaining in view for a somewhat longer period. Then towards evening it grew misty and so through the night. The next day we were still encompassed by the mist, the weather remaining quiet. For four days we drifted through this strange haze until, on the evening of the fourth day, there grew upon our ears the murmur of breakers at a distance. Gradually it became plainer, and somewhat after midnight it appeared to sound upon either hand at no very great space. The raft was raised upon a swell several times, and then we were in smooth water and the noise of the breakers was behind. When the morning came, we found we were in a sort of great lagoon, but of this we noticed little at the time, for close before us, through the enshrouding mist, loomed the hull of a large sailing vessel. With one accord we fell upon our knees and thanked God, for we thought that here was an end to our perils. We had much to learn. The raft drew near the ship, and we shouted on them to take us aboard, but none answered. Presently the raft touched against the side of the vessel, and, seeing a rope hanging downwards, I seized it and began to climb, yet I had much ado to make my way up because of a kind of grey, lecherous fungus which had seized upon the rope and which blotched the side of the ship lividly. I reached the rail and clambered over it on to the deck. Here I saw that the decks were covered with gray masses, some of them rising into modules several feet in height, but at the time I thought less of this matter than of the possibilities of there being people aboard the ship. I shouted, but none answered. Then I went to the door below the poop deck. I opened it and peered in. There was a great swell of staleness, and so that I knew in a moment that nothing living was within, and with the knowledge I shut the door quickly, for I felt suddenly lonely. I went back to the side where I had scrambled up. My, my sweetheart was still sitting quietly upon the raft. Seeing me look down, she called up to know whether there was any aboard the ship. I replied that the vessel had the appearance of having been long deserted, but that if she would wait a little I would see whether there was anything in the shape of a ladder by which she could ascend to the deck. Then we would make a search through the vessel together. A little later, on the opposite side of the deck, I found a rope-side ladder, 
This I carried across, and a minute afterward she was beside me. Together we explored the cabins and apartments in the after part of the ship, but nowhere was there any sign of life. Here and there within the cabins themselves we came across odd patches of that queer fungus, but this, as my sweetheart said, could be cleaned away. In the end, having assured ourselves that the after portions of the vessel was empty, we picked our way to the bows, between the ugly gray modules of that strange growth, and here we made a further search, which told us that there was indeed none aboard but ourselves. This being now beyond any doubt, we returned to the stern of the ship and proceeded to make ourselves as comfortable as possible. Together we cleared out and cleaned two of the cabins, and after that I made an examination whether there was anything edible in the ship. This I soon found so, and I thanked God in my heart for his goodness. In addition to this, I discovered the whereabouts of the fresh water pump, and having fixed it, I found the water drinkable, though somewhat unpleasant to the taste. For several days we stayed aboard the ship without attempting to get to the shore. We were busily engaged in making the place habitable, yet even thus early we became aware that our lot was even less to be desired than might have been imagined, for though at first step we scraped away the odd patches of growth that studied the floors and walls of the cabin and saloon, yet they were turned almost to their original size within the space of twenty-four hours, which not only discouraged us but gave us a feeling of vague unease. Still we would not admit ourselves beaten, so set to work afresh and not only scraped away the fungus, but soaked the places where it had been, with carbolic, a canful of which I had found in the pantry. Yet by the end of the week the growth had returned in full strength, and in addition it had spread to other places, as though our touching it had allowed germs from it to travel elsewhere. On the seventh morning my sweetheart woke to find a small patch of it growing on her pillow close to her face. At that she came to me, so soon as she could get her garments upon her. I was in the galley at the time, lighting the fire for breakfast. Come here, John, she said, and led me aft. When I saw the thing upon her pillow, I shuddered, and then and there we agreed to go right out of the ship and see whether we could not fare to make ourselves more comfortable ashore. Hurriedly we gathered together our few belongings, and even amongst these I found that the fungus had been at work, for one of her shawls had a little lump of it growing near one edge. I threw the whole thing over the side without saying anything to her. The rat was still alongside, but it was too clumsy to guide, and I lowered it down a small boat that hung across the stern, and in this we made our way to the shore. Yet, as we drew near to it, I became gradually aware that here the vile fungus which had driven us from the ship was growing riot. In places it rose into horrible, fantastic mounds, which seemed almost to quiver with a quiet life when the wind blew across them. Here and there it took the forms of vast fingers, and in others it just spread out flat and smooth and treacherous odd places it appeared as grotesque stunted trees seeming extraordinarily kinked and gnarled the whole quaking vilely at times at first it seemed to us that there was no single portion of the surrounding shore which was not hidden beneath the masses of the hideous lichen. Yet in this I found we were mistaken, for somewhat later, coasting along the shore of a little distance, we described a smooth white patch of what appeared to be fine sand, and there we landed. It was not sand. What it was I do not know. All that I have observed is that upon it the fungus will not grow, while everywhere else save where the sin-like earth wanders oddly, pathwise, amid the gray dissolution of the lichen, there is nothing but that loathsome grayness. It is difficult to make you understand how cheered we were to find one place that was absolutely free from the growth, and here we deposited our belongings. Then we went back to the ship for such matters 
as it seemed to us we should need among other matters i managed to bring ashore with me one of the ship's sails with which i constructed two small tents which though exceedingly rough shaped served the purpose for which they were intended in these we lived and stored our various necessities and thus for a matter of some four weeks all went smoothly and without particular unhappiness indeed i may say with much of happiness for for we were together it was on the thumb of her right hand that the growth first showed it was only a small circular spot much like a little gray mole my god how the fear leapt to my heart when she showed me the place we cleansed it between us washing it with carbolic and water in the morning of the following day she showed her hand to me again the gray warty thing had returned for a little while we looked at one another in silence then still wordless we started again to her movement in the midst of the operation she spoke suddenly what's that on the side of your face dear her voice was sharp with anxiety i put my hand up to feel there under the hair by your ear a little to the front a bit my finger rested on the place and then i knew let us get your thumb done first i said and she submitted only because she was afraid to touch me until it was cleansed i finished washing and disinfecting her thumb and then she turned to my face after it was finished we sat together and talked a while of many things for there had come into our lives sudden very terrible thoughts we were all at once afraid of something worse than death we spoke of loading the boat with provisions and water and making our way out onto the sea yet we were helpless for many causes and and the growth had attacked us already we decided to stay god would do with us what he will we would wait a month two months three months passed and the places grew somewhat and there had come others yet we fought so strenuously with the fear that its headway was but slow comparatively speaking occasionally we ventured off to the ship for such stores as we needed then we found that the fungus grew persistently one of the modules on the main deck became soon as high as my head and we had now given up all thought or hope of leaving the island we had realized that it would be unallowable to go amongst healthy humans with the things from which we were suffering with this determination and knowledge in our minds we knew that we should have to husband our food and water for we did not know at the time but that we should possibly live for many years this reminds me that i have told you that i am an old man judging by the years this is not so but but he broke off then continued somewhat abruptly as i was saying we knew that we should have to use care in the matter of food but we had no idea then how little food there was left of which to take care it was a week later that i made the discovery that all of the other bread tanks which i had supposed full were empty and that beyond odd tents of vegetables and meat and some other materials we had nothing upon which to depend but the bread in the tank which i had already opened after learning this i bestirred myself to do what i could and met to work at fishing in the lagoon but met with no success at this i was somewhat inclined to feel desperate until the thought came to me to try outside the lagoon in the open sea here at times i caught odd fish but so infrequently that they proved of but little help in keeping us from the hunger which threatened it seemed to me that our deaths were likely to come by hunger and not by the growth of the thing which had seized upon our bodies we were in this state of mind when the fourth month wore out 
when I made a very horrible discovery. One morning, a little before midday, I came off the ship with a portion of the biscuits which were left. In the mouth of her tent I saw my sweetheart sitting, eating something. What is it, my dear? I called out as I leapt ashore. Yet on hearing my voice she seemed confused, and turning slyly threw something towards the edge of the little clearing. It fell short, and a vague suspicion having arisen within me, I walked across and picked it up. It was a piece of the grey fungus. As I went to her with it in my hand, she turned deadly pale, then rose red. I felt strangely dazed and frightened. My dear, my dear, I cried. I could say no more. Yet at words she broke down and cried bitterly. Gradually, as she calmed, I got from her the news that she had tried it in the preceding day and, and liked it. I got her to promise on her knees not to touch it again, however great our hunger. After she had promised, she told me that the desire for it had come suddenly, and that until the moment of desire she had experienced nothing towards it but the most extreme repulsion. Later in the day, feeling strangely restless and much shaken with the thing which I had discovered, I made my way along one of the twisted paths formed by the white sin-like substance, which led among the fungoid growth. I had, once before, ventured along there, but not to any great distance. This time, being involved in perplexing thoughts, I had went much further than hitherto. Suddenly I was called to myself by a queer, hoarse sound on my left. Turning quickly, I saw that there was movement among an extraordinarily shaped mass of fungus close to my elbow. It was swaying uneasily, as though it possessed life of its own. Abruptly, as I stared, the thought came to me that the thing had a grotesque resemblance to the figure of a distorted human creature. Even as the fancy flashed into my brain, there was a slight sickening noise of tearing, and I saw that one of the branch-like arms was detaching itself from the surrounding gray masses and coming towards me. The head of the thing, a shapeless gray ball, inclined in my direction. I stood stupidly, and the vile arm brushed across my face. I gave out a frightened cry and ran back a few paces. There was a sweetish taste upon my lips where the thing had touched me. I licked them and was immediately filled with an inhuman desire. I turned and seized a mass of the fungus, then more and more. I was insatiable. In the midst of devouring, the remembrance of the morning's discovery swept into my mazed brain. It was sent by God. I dashed the fragment I held to the ground, then utterly wretched and feeling a dreadful guiltiness, I made my way back to the little encampment. I think she knew, by some marvellous intuition which love must have given, so soon as she set eyes upon me. Her quiet sympathy made it easier for me, and I told her of my sudden weakness, yet omitted to mention the extraordinary thing which had gone before. I desired to spare her all unnecessary terror. But for myself I had added an intolerable knowledge to breed an incessant terror in my brain, for I doubted it not but that I had seen the end of one of those men who had come to the island in the ship in the lagoon, and in that monstrous ending I had seen our own. Thereafter we kept from the abominable food, though the desire for it had entered into our blood. Yet our drear punishment was upon us, for day by day, with monstrous rapidity, the fungoid growth took hold of our poor bodies. Nothing we could do would check it materially, and so we who had been human became, well, it matters less each day, only, only we had been man and maid, and day by day the fight is more dreadful to withstand the hunger-lust for the terrible lichen. 
A week ago we ate the last of the biscuit, and since that time I have caught three fish. I was out here fishing tonight when your schooner drifted upon me out of the mist. I hailed you. You know the rest. And may God, out of his great heart, bless you for your goodness to, to a, a couple of poor outcast souls. There was a dip of an oar, another. Then the voice came again for the last time, sounding through the slight surrounding mist, ghostly and mournful. God bless you. Good-bye. Good-bye, we shouted together, hoarsely, our hearts full of many emotions. I glanced about me. I became aware that the dawn was upon us. The sun flung a stray beam across the hidden sea, pierced the mist dully, and lit up the receding boat with a gloomy fire. Indistinctly, I saw something nodding between the oars. I thought of a sponge, a great gray sodding sponge. The oars continued to fly. They were gray, as with a boat, and my eyes searched a moment vainly for the conjunction of hand and oar. My gaze flashed back to the to the head. It nodded forward as the oars went backward for the stroke. Then the oars were dipped, the boat shot out of the patch of light, and then the the thing went nodding into the mist. End of The Voice in the Night by William Hope Hodgson This recording is in the public domain.